आनंद मेरा स्लाइड चेंज हो रहा है क्या देख लो सर चेंज तो हुआ है सर हो रहा है ना हाँ हाँ ओके ओके परफेक्ट कभी कभी क्या है वो डालने के बाद चेंज नहीं होता इसे वो कभी प्रॉब्लम हो जाती पता है त्यागी सब आया नहीं लगता ना जस्ट लॉग इन कर रहे कर रहे यस मैंने उनको थोड़ा सा लिंक में कोई ये हो गया है अभी ना हाँ आ गए आ गए सर आ गए अजय सर आ गए So, can we start now, sir? Or one minute, we can wait. Or next one, people are coming gradually. Thank you, sir. Are you there? So we can start, sir. Sir, thank you, sir. Yeah. Am I audible now? Yeah, now yes, the audible, sir. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. So can we start now, sir? Yes. Okay. Welcome, Dr. Krishnan, Dr. Pai, Dr. Patnaik, speakers, fourth speaker is also there. Dr. Yes. Yeah. All okay, are there. All four speakers are there. Okay, good, good. So, yeah, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. So, now we will be starting the fourth day, the second session, invited session. So, now may I request Dr. Ajit Tyagi, sir, to kindly chair this session. He is the former Director General of Metrology in our department and also uh, actively involved in this uh, IWM7 as co chair and currently senior advisor at Integrated Research and Action for Development, New Delhi, and member of WMO WWRP Working Group on Tropical Metrology. He has served as Kotesaram Chair, Professor with Ministry of Arts Sciences, Data as a DGM, IMD, and Department of Assistant Chief of Air Staff in Indian Air Force. He was permanent dependent of India during 2009 to 2013 with WMO and member of its Agility Council. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. But now it's okay. Let's. Yeah, yeah, sir. Okay, so now it is over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Patnaik, for uh, my introduction, and uh, I, it is a matter of great honor and privilege to chair this important session where we have got four invited talks by by eminent climate scientists covering uh, from climate change projections under volcanic conditions to this operational applications for extended range predictions for the agriculture. Also, important aspect related to urban flooding. And of course, the seasonal predictions, which are always been a, a, a challenge and, and also expectations of the society to have. Uh, so we have four talks covering all these topics. Uh, and the first talk to start is uh, from Dr. Krishnan, uh, Dr. Krishnan is, is, uh, needs no introduction. Uh, climate scientist par excellence uh, is head of the Climate Change Center at IITM and also acting as a director of IITM. Uh, his, his work in, in AR6 and start developing uh, Indian model, Earth system model, which took uh, part in the AR6 is really commendable. And, uh, he had played a very supportive role to the International Workshop Monsoon by organizing an international training workshop with the help of um, IMPO at, at IITM. So thank you, Dr. Krishnan, for your support. And we look forward to your presentations uh, on, on volcanic impact of volcanic eruptions in the changing climate. Over to you, Dr. Krishnan. Thank you, Che. Uh, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity for to present in the IWM7. And um, let me share my screen. Yeah, so uh, good evening good afternoon good morning to everyone uh, so today's talk i will uh, i will be talking about the the role of the implications of volcanic aerosols for seasonal forecasting of the indian uh, indian monsoon in a changing climate and uh, so uh, I, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators particularly manmeet singh ayantika choudhury p swapna tp sabin Vedartha Goswami, Ramesh, Bellur, Rajesh, Sandeep, Chandra Venkatraman, Raik Donners, uh, Norbert Marvan, and Jorgen Kurtz. Um, so, uh, this is a combined study based on one of our earlier works. Um, and uh, yeah. yeah, so we know that uh, the recent morning, uh, Dr. Andy Turner gave a very nice presentation of how the the climate has impacted the regional monsoons. Uh, the sixth assessment report of the ICC, IPCC comes out with very powerful attributions of the, the human influence on the climate system. And uh, we know very well from the CMIP-6 models and also the earlier IPCC assessments that 
the warming that we have seen in the 20th century uh, can is largely attributable to the human influence, mainly due to the increase of the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but we also see that there are these episodes of cooling. Uh, you can see both in the natural experiment uh, where there is no anthropogenic forcing. There are these episodes of cool, cooling which was uh, which are associated with major eruptions. This is the Pinatubo eruptions in 1991. And we also see the signatures of the El Chichon in 1983 and also the Mount Agang. So these major uh, eruptions, volcanic eruptions have affected the global mean temperatures for a few years. And uh, they are also an important uh, source of unpredictability in the near term. I'll, come, I'll be coming to that. So in addition to these volcanic uh, forcings, which uh, eruptions which inject a lot of aerosols into the stratosphere, they can cool the surface and the atmosphere. Uh, anthropogenic aerosols have also cooled. They have also masked the greenhouse gas warming. So this is again from the AR6. So if we had only greenhouse gas warming, the uh, only the GHGs, the warming during 2010 to 2019 would have been about one and a half degrees compared to the pre-industrial uh, temperatures. But now, uh, the, and the aerosol effects have basically the sulfate, sulfur, sulfur dioxide, they have offset, there, there's a cooling of about 0.4 degrees. So the, the aerosol cooling has kind of masked the, the greenhouse gas warming. This is also, this is mainly the anthropogenic aerosols. And uh, that is one of the, and these are very, very strong implications for the hydrological cycle, the aerosol effects and the monsoons, which was very nicely highlighted by Professor Andy's talk this morning. And um, so these different drivers, one is the greenhouse gas, the other is the aerosols. They have affected the global monsoons as well as the regional monsoons. And uh, the assessment that comes out uh, from the AR6 is the global land monsoon precipitation decreased from the 50s to the 80s, partly due to anthropogenic aerosols. Uh, they have kind of uh, uh, offset the precipitation enhancement due to the greenhouse gases. But after the 80s, there has been an increase in the precipitation, particularly over the West African monsoon region in response to the GHG forcing and large scale multi-decadal variability. And in the future, uh, during the 21st century, the global land monsoon precipitation is projected to increase in response to GHG warming in all time horizons and scenarios. And also we saw in the morning that in the long term, the global monsoon rainfall will feature a robust north-south asymmetry characterized by a greater increase in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere and also an enhanced east-west asymmetry characterized by enhanced Asian and African monsoons and a weak, weakened North American monsoon. And uh, so, uh, so when we look at the observed uh, changes in the monsoon precipitation 1951 to 2014, uh, this is for the South and Southeast Asia that, that is shown in the left, left column and the East Asian monsoon that is the right column. Uh, what is shown in the top panel is the trends from the observed trends are shown by for three different data sets, the Aphrodite, CRU and GPCC. You can see particularly for the South Asian monsoon region, a kind of a negative trend, declining trend in the monsoon precipitation. And uh, the model, CMIP-6 models, uh, they show that the all forcing run the, with both the natural and the anthropogenic forcing run, the multi-model, when we see, they're able to explain the declining trend in the monsoon precipitation. And also the opposing effects of the GHG, this is only the, this whisker with this, which is shown in green is only the aerosol forcing experiment. And the red one is the GHG forcing experiment. You can see the op opposite influence of the greenhouse gas forcing and the aerosol forcing on the monsoon precipitation over South Asia. A similar picture we also see over the East Asian monsoon region, although the, the contrast is much lower as, as compared to the South Asian monsoon. And um, because it's dominated more by interdecadal variability, and when we look at the time series of precipitation, uh, we see, we do see a declining trend uh, in the precipitation with some recovery that we are seeing in the recent uh, years over for the South Asian region. So we have to also keep in mind there is a kind of interdecadal variability that is affecting these long term changes. Uh, and this is a brief assessment of the Asian monsoons. 
So the South and Southeast Asian monsoon precipitation decreased since the mid 20th century, the dominant cause being the anthropogenic aerosols. These are the, this is the anthropogenic aerosol being the responsible for the decline in the monsoon precipitation. Also the dry south and wet, uh, dry north and wet south pattern of East Asian summer monsoon precipitation change results from the combined effects of both GHG gases and uh, greenhouse gases and aerosols. This is also a high confidence statement. The important point is in the near term, that is we say that is the 2021 to 2040, the South, East, uh, South, East, South and Southeast Asian monsoon and the East Asian monsoon precipitation will be dominated by the effects of internal variability. This is something which Andy Turner highlighted in the morning and uh, but will increase in the long term, that is 2081 to 2100. And uh, so the internal variability is a source of, uh, uh, is, is a source of uncertainty and also unpredictable natural forcings like volcanic eruptions. This is what I will be coming. The uh, volcanic eruptions, large volcanic eruptions uh, are also, un, uh, they are unpredictable natural forcing and this is a source of uncertainty for the near term projections of regional monsoons. So, so I just want to build up on this. So volcanic eruptions, now many studies are showing that uh, large volcanic eruptions like the Pinatubo uh, eruption and several others, they can trigger El Nino likes patterns in the Pacific. And this is a paper by Kodri et al, which appeared in uh, Nature Communications. Uh, they, they evaluated five different eruptions, the Pinatubo, El Chichan, Mount Agang, Santa Maria and Krakatoa. And the and what they did was they if you remove the tropical mean SST uh, that so this is a relative trop SST anomaly. Once you re uh, remove the tro tropical mean SST, you can see a, a, about a year after the eruption, the development of a El Nino like warming pattern. So basically, these large uh, eruptions, uh, volcanic eruptions, they they introduce stratosphere aerosols in the stratosphere which can backscatter the radiation and reduce the global mean surface temperature. But about a year or so, they can favor the development of an El Nino-like pattern. And uh, this is seen in the CMIP-5 model simulations. Uh, basically, the volcanically induced cooling, uh, what they show is over the tropical Africa, it weakens the West African monsoon and the resulting atmospheric Kelvin wave drives equatorial westerly wind anomalies over the West Pacific. And this wind anomaly is further amplified by air sea interactions in the Pacific, favoring an El Nino like response. Uh, so they can drive El Nino like conditions, big major volcanic eruptions. And now, this is one more recent study that came out in Nature. Uh, they say that climate change can modulate the stratospheric volcanic sulfate aerosols life cycle and radiative forcing from tropical eruptions. This is by Aubrey et al. in 2021. They argue that, uh, uh, that the cooling effect of uh, very large eruptions, they can be rare eruptions, but very large eruptions, they will, inc they will increase in the future due to climate change. Because with, with warming, the, the tropopause height is going to be, uh, there is going to be an increase in the tropopause height and the buoyancy of the atmosphere will, will increase. So due to the buoyancy, increase, increased buoyancy of the gases, the, the aerosols which are injected by the uh, eruptions, they can go high, much higher in the stratosphere and their cooling effect can be much, much more higher. So, uh, so the same Pinatubo eruptions in the future, the cooling impact can be much more profound. And um, so these two effects, keeping this in mind, now the question is what is its relevance for the monsoon? So one, once we cool the land, the Asian landmass, Definitely, the impact of the vol uh, volcano is going to affect the, uh, the land sea thermal contrast and it can have an impact on the monsoon. And also, through the influence of volcanic eruptions on the ENSO, ENSO like pattern, it can affect the monsoon. So, uh, uh, in uh, uh, about more than 20 years back, Krishna Kumar et al., they had proposed a famous paper in which a science paper where, where they showed that the ENSO and monsoon correlations are becoming weaker and the, due to secular variations in the ENSO and monsoon relationships. And subsequent to this studies, there was a paper by Marwan and Kurt in 2005, where they argued that if you want to really look at the relationship between two systems, like the oscillatory systems, like the ENSO and the Indian monsoon, uh, you have to not look at not just the amplitude uh, variations or the connections between the amplitude variations in the monsoon and the ENSO, 
but also look at how the phases of these two oscillatory systems behave. Uh, because a simple correlation is only a kind of a linear metric, but if you want to look at a, a phase of these two oscillatory systems, it, it, it has a nonlinear uh, relationship. And what they noted was by doing this kind of phase coherence analysis between these two ENSO and monsoon indices, what they found was certain epochs. There were some epochs where the ENSO monsoon were, were, were highly correlated. So you can see these plateaus here in this. Uh, these are areas of very strong coherence of the ENSO and monsoon. And interestingly, many of these uh, uh, epochs where there has been a co coherence between these two uh, oscillatory systems, they were preceded by major volcanic eruptions. This is the Pinatubo eruptions. This is the major cooling. This is the volcanic radiative forcing what is shown here. And you can see followed by this big eruption is a very strong phase coherence. And you see also similarly after this is after Ed Agang and after Pinatubo. So uh, typically what they, they so they conjectured that these big volcanic eruptions can be a mechanism for introducing phase coherence of these Enso and monsoon oscillatory systems. And motivated by this work, um, uh, my colleague Manmeet Singh, he did, we, and we wrote this paper in 2020, whether we can fingerprint the volcanic forcing, effects of the volcanic forcing on the Enso monsoon coupling. And uh, for this, we used uh, uh, various uh, different types of data. We used the historical data, also paleoclimatic reconstructions of monsoon and Enso in, uh, indices. And uh, from the proxies and also last millennium climate simulations, more than 1000 years of uh, simulations and also large ensemble targeted simulation experiments using the IATM Earth system model and various nonlinear advanced techniques. And what we found was that uh, large volcanic eruptions can significantly enhance the phase synchronization of ENSO and Indian monsoon oscillation due to an increase in the angular frequency of ENSO. So basically, the ENSO is a kind of a oscillatory system with, which has a time scale of about uh, two to seven years, three to seven years, and uh, which is a slowly evolving oscillatory system. Whereas the Indian monsoon is happening year after year, is a is a fast oscillatory system. And now, if there are these big eruptions, uh, they can uh, they can do it. They can, this can result in a phase synchronization of the ENSO uh, by by increasing the angular frequency of ENSO. Uh, so that there can be a synchronization of these two oscillatory systems and these has implications for the uh, monsoon seasonal forecasting and basically if you want to do the phase coherence analysis i don't i don't want to get into the details uh, so when we have the time series of enso and uh, indian monsoon time series you can apply the hilbert transform and can compute the phases and by computing the phases of these oscillatory systems will be estimate we can find out what is the phase difference between these two uh, oscillatory systems. And uh, we also use the last millennium simulations from the PMIP3 models, the Paleo model intercomparison program. This is the IPSL model, the French model, which has more than a thousand years simulation for the last millennium. This is for the last millennium is 850 to 1850 AD. This is the Nino 3 SST variations for thousand years. And this is the ISMR from the IPSL model. Uh, so if we do a phase space plot of these two oscillatory systems, both the ENSO and IM, so we find that they are self-sustained oscillators, so with a common attractor. And uh, so we can apply the, the phase, uh, phase coherence analysis. And uh, so in this analysis, we did the phase coherence analysis of the uh, ENSO and monsoon oscillations from the IPSL model. PMIP3 simulation. This is the phase difference between the NINO and the ISMR phase differences. These are the absolute phases. That is, after every cycle, we add a 2 pi. And uh, what we find is these are there are epochs where there is a phase coherence where, where we see these plateaus. And typically, these plateaus have happened after these big eruptions in the, and, uh, in the, uh, in, in, during the last millennium. By the way, the uh, last millennium simulations, they include the effect of the volcanic eruptions. And uh, there were several eruptions during the last millennium. And we do see that followed by these big eruptions, there are these periods of phase coherence between the ENSO and monsoon. And uh, we also did a statistical significance following a twin, uh, twin surrogate method. We generated 5,000 twin surrogates of the Indian monsoon and the, the ENSO indices. 
and we find that the, the the what we see from the historical the the last millennium simulation of the ipsl uh, the probability density function uh, probability density of this phase difference between these two oscillatory systems uh, the probability is much higher as compared to the the bootstrap the surrogates so this is statistically significant and the phase difference is between 0 and 2 pi indicating that they are kind of out of phase and uh, and also we did uh, using the proxy records we did bayesian analysis of we had 14 enso proxies and 11 indian monsoon proxies and uh, we did the conditional Bay bayesian probability analysis what we noted was uh, the, the 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 whenever there is a uh, el nino if the coincidence between uh, el ninos and droughts and laninas and excess monsoon uh, in the absence of volcano and during what prior after and following volcanic eruptions what we find is that the probability of the enso monsoon coupling is significantly enhanced following a volcanic eruption in the previous year and uh, we and as i said earlier these big eruptions also lead to major cooling over the the uh, eurasian landmass and this is from the trading proxies of cook et al during the uh, last millennium many of these eruptions were associated with large cooling of the asian cont eurasian continent and uh, in addition we used uh, large ensemble experiments uh, using the iatm earth system model to understand the effect of the uh, volcanic large volcanic eruptions on the enso monsoon coupling uh, this is the IATM Earth System model, which, which includes the effect of the volcanic eruptions. And, uh, and what we know, we had more than 100 simulations, uh, 100 member ensemble members, starting with different uh, uh, initial conditions, uh, starting with a, a neutral initial condition, starting with the warm initial condition, that is the El Nino phase initial condition, and starting with cold state. This is the typical La Nina cold state. Uh, we had more than 100 members and uh, we start and this is we applied these ex experiments uh, with and without the volcanic eruption we considered the krakatova eruption in 1883 80 yeah it started some sometime around june 1883 and this was a very major eruption which lasted for more than a, more than a year and uh, this is the aerosol optical depth uh, due to the krakatova eruption and what we found from these uh, so this is the difference in the nino 3 between the uh, experiment with volcanic forcing and without volcanic forcing. And these are the member to member differences in the Nino 3 SST anomaly. So what we see is typically after an about a year or so, we, we see the uh, appearance of an El Nino like pattern in the, in the model. And uh, similar feature you see in the warm initial state. With the cold initial state, when we start this experiment, the appearance of the El Nino happens much faster. The evolution of the ocean heat content ana anomalies happen at a faster rate. And uh, when we look at the changes in the, uh, the surface air temperature and the SST, uh, in the Pacific we see a El Nino-like pattern, but a major cooling of the Eurasian landmass and also the entire northern hemisphere landmass. And, uh, and this coupling, we also see changes in the, the ocean thermocline deepening. This is the D20 in the, in the coupled model uh, due to the effect of the volcanic forcing. And we see a major decrease in the precipitation over uh, South and Southeast Asia and also the West Pacific region. Uh, and this is mainly because of when we cool one hemisphere, especially the Northern Hemisphere to the relative to the Southern Hemisphere, the ITCZ generally we know theoretical arguments show that the ITCZ tends to shift, shift southward and we see a major precipitation re reduction over the monsoon regions. And uh, this is because of the decrease, this is associated with the decrease of the shortwave radiation at the surface. And uh, now the question is what are its implications for seasonal forecasting? I just looked at this, uh, the, this is from the monsoon mission model, the T382 CFS model. Uh, multi-model ensemble model where they have done the hind cast from 1988 to 2017 and uh, this is one of the uh, good models showing the very high correlation skill in the seasonal forecasts which Surya presented uh, but what we see interestingly is that when we talk about 1992 this was following the volcanic eruption of the Pinatubo the model fails to capture the precipitation decrease that happened now, 1992 was a very deficient monsoon. It was not a big drought, but a substantial deficiency in the seasonal monsoon, which the, the NCEP, uh, this CFS model fails to capture. 
one of the reasons we thought was maybe this wall, this model doesn't have the effect of the volcanic uh, eruption of the Pinatubo. And uh, to test that hypothesis, we use the IATM Earth System model, um, which is at a much coarser resolution, a T62, which is something like a 200 kilometer grid, and which has a, a, the MOM4P1, a more advanced version of the, the ocean model. And uh, it also has both anthropogenic aerosols as well as the volcanic aerosols. And we had this all forcing experiment, uh, which includes the GHG, the aerosols, uh, both natural and anthropogenic. Uh, when I say natural dust, volcanoes and so on, and the anthropogenic coming from the CMIP-6 models. And this is a 30 member seasonal run, uh, hindcast done by uh, Manmeet. And we start, we had 30 initial conditions of 00 Z starting from 21st April to 20th May 1992. And when we did this forecast, uh, and this is showing the aerosol optical depth at 550 nanometers. This is in the uh, in, in the in the uh, in the visible visible range. You can see that this is the latitude variation of the aerosol optical depth, and this is the time variation. So this is the latitude depth time variation. So 1983, you can see the LG Chan mostly dominating in the northern hemisphere. Uh, the Pinatubo was a much stronger eruption and the, the effect of the aerosols, they were distributed globally across both the hemispheres, both the northern and the southern hemisphere. And, uh, and it, it had a global impact, global signature of this uh, uh, Pinatubo eruption. And interestingly, uh, in fact, we have done this uh, hindcast experiment not just for 92. Uh, we did it right from 19, 1982 onwards up to uh, 2014 or 15 and two years are missing by the way 1986 and uh, 2000 the hindcast are yet to be done what we find is the what is shown is in the cmap precipitation by the blue blue bar and the iatm esm all forcing experiment 30 ensemble members by the orange bar interestingly we are cap we are able to capture this precipitation decrease in 1992 and uh, with the with the volcanic forcing and uh, we also did an experiment where we removed the anthropogenic aerosols in the in the, in the experiment and uh, this is shown by the green line and uh, uh, the the orange orange bar shows uh, it has both anthropogenic and the natural aerosols and the green line has only the natural aerosols so both of them show that the, the precipitation decrease in 1992 showing the signatures uh, of the aerosol yeah, I'm almost coming to an end, sir. Uh, and uh, when we look at the spatial pattern uh, of the, uh, this is the CMAC precipitation for JJS 1992. You can see precipitation decrease over the Indian land mass and very pronounced signature in the in the IATM ESM. And we also see the development of a strong El Nilo like pattern, which is much stronger in the model compared to observations. Finally, this is my summary. So human induced climate change in particular greenhouse gases has been the main driver of observed intensification of heavy precipitation over the land regions, global land regions. And the, the expected precipitation and en uh, enhancement by uh, of the monsoon by greenhouse gas forcing since the 1950s has been offset by uh, uh, precipitation reduction caused by the Northern hemispheric anthropogenic aerosols. Internal variability and unpredictable natural forcing due to, like, for example, due to volcanic eruptions can lower the degree of confidence in, pro in projecting regional monsoon changes, especially in the near term, that is 2021 to 2040. Basically, volcanic ash and other gaseous matter from these large volcanic eruptions which enter into the stratosphere, they alter the global mean surface temperature through backscatter and absorption of this shortwave radiation. Leader, leading to changes in the atmosphere and ocean circulation in the global hydrological cycle. And typically, these large volcanic eruptions can trigger El Nino-like SST anomalies within two years following the eruption. And in our recent study shows that the LVEs can also promote a significant phase synchronization of the ENSO and monsoon oscillations due to an increase in the angular frequency of ENSO. With the hindcast, ensemble hindcast experiments using the IATM experiment indicate that the Pinatubo eruption in 1991 had a significant role in the decrease of the Indian summer monsoon precipitation during 1992. So we want to do further experiments. So the question is whether large volcanic eruptions are an important source of uh, monsoon predictability, which we have kind of overlooked all these years. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you, Dr. Krishnan, for uh, highlighting the importance of uh, large scale work and eruptions in regional, seasonal forecasts. And I wish we had some more time for question and answer sessions, but uh, tight schedule of these sessions. Uh, I'll request uh, uh, participants to directly contact you if they have any any verifications for any further work uh, on this, this aspect. No doubt it brings out importance of large, such uh, physical processes to be included in, in, in the operational models. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan. Yeah, and thank now you, sir. we move to the next uh, presentation uh, from uh, Dr. Haley. Well, <laughs> Oh, so shall I start immediately or? <laughs> yeah, let me introduce you. Your uh, this is a great honor to have you here with us. Thank you for sending an invited talk and delivering it today. Uh, you are the head of the working group of the flood risk and climate adaptation. Uh, you, you see the importance of uh, weather forecast and climate forecast are for the societal uh, and the urban flooding is becoming because of heavy rainfall a major cause of concern and we are happy that you are going to cover this important aspect in today's presentation over to you dr heri okay thank you very much so i start sharing my screen i hope Please. you will be able to see it Okay, I hope you see my screen now. So I start, I'm very happy and thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to present you my work here. So I come to a very different topic, different from the continent. So my examples are mainly from Germany, different also in temporal and spatial scale, because I want to present you some of our results on impact-based forecasting of urban flooding. So this is a very localized um, phenomenon, often not even um, affecting a whole city, only parts of a city. And also, if we talk about uh, forecasting and early warning, it's about um, minutes, to an hour or so what we have in respect to forecasting and early warning. So quite different from the talk before, but I hope you are still interested. And um, before I start, I also want to acknowledge the contribution of my um, colleagues, Victor Röser, who also used to work with me at the German Research Center for Geosciences and is now working at the London School of Economics and my colleague Insa Neuweiler, who is um, the chair of fluid mechanics and environmental physics in civil engineering at the University of Hanover. Ah, sorry, um, let's see, now it's not working to move forward. I don't know what the technical problem is here. So, oh yeah, so let's hope that it's working now. Yes, so yes. our definition of forecasting is rather broad. So in terms of uh, this, we talk about timely, all timely information, which is helpful to improve the management in emergency phases shortly before, during, or after a hazardous event, here particularly pluvial flooding in cities. This is also in accordance with the early warning definition of the UNISDR, where these uh, forecasts are treated as an essential element for each early warning system. Um, particularly early warning is particularly important to avoid um, health effects or fatalities, but it can also be used to um, reduce economic or direct economic damage. This is what we tested here. We looked at um, different situations of early warning and compared these in respect to their effect on the content loss 
or the building lofts of residential buildings. So we uh, looked at only early warning, irrespective of any other um, by, um, information. Then we looked at early warning where we knew that the warning contained helpful information. And then the third situation was that we looked at um, people who received an early warning and additionally did know what to do. And what we see is that only these two situations where the people received an early warning in, with sufficient lead time and did know what to do, they were able to reduce their damage to the building and to the contents. So this is also quite significant because what we have seen is that the average reduction of the contents loss was about 3,800 euros, which is quite significant if we compare it to the average absolute content loss of 17,000 euros. And also in respect to the building loss, the achieved reduction was on average quite significant with 10,000 euros. And this needs to be compared with an average absolute building loss of 48,000 euros. So this is quite significant. And this also shows how important um, good early warning is so but what makes people know what to do when they receive an early warning so here i compare two flood events in germany and of course what one expects and uh, what is rather well known is that flood experience is a very important driver for learning so we had uh, two very similar flood events, one in 2002, one in 2013, and they both affected the Danube and the Elbe river catchments in Germany. During the first event in 2002, most of the people which we surveyed said that it was totally unclear to them what to do when the warning reached them. On the other hand, then in 2013, most of the people stated that it was totally clear to them what to do. But of course, if we want to improve the emergency action of the affected people, we cannot wait until all are were affected by a flood and all gained experience via that. Therefore, we additionally investigated what other factors made people to know better what to do. And these are um, here indicated with this red um, uh, marking here. So people who had undertaken precautionary measures, so long-term precaution, they knew better what to do also in the case of an emergency. And very interesting also, if the flood early warning did contain helpful information, then this also increased the knowledge of the people what to do. And this brings us now to this impact-based forecasting. What is it actually? Impact-based forecasting means that we do not only forecast and use in the warning how much precipitation is expected at a particularly urban area, but um, combine this with exposure and vulnerability assessments and um, add to the hazard impact model and additionally impact forecasting. So this means that we, uh, for an urban flooding, do not only estimate what the precipitation might be, but also which parts of the city we expect to be inundated, which streets we expect to be inundated and not a, um, available for transportation anymore, and also what in which areas there might be hotspots of direct economic damage. Of course, if we look at these different um, data and modeling um, 
the, which need to be undertaken. We can also imagine that this is also more difficult and associated with more uncertainty. So for instance, this figure here shows how vulnerability of residential buildings in respect to mitigation measures implemented over this time span here. So we investigated from 1990 until 2012. When did people implement precautionary measures at their residential building? And we see that there was a highly dynamic implementation of measures. And therefore, this makes it even more difficult to come up with sound impact-based forecasting. Additionally, also, if we compare um, metrological forecasting models hydrological, hydraulic, and damage modeling, we see that normally the damage modeling is associated with the highest uncertainty and um, often very simple models, stage damage functions are used to estimate the flood damage. Therefore, this also adds additional uncertainty and additional um, problems for the impact-based forecasting. So now I would like to um, introduce you to one impact-based forecasting model, which we implemented for a city in Germany, the city of Hanover. So this um, modeling system contains different components. So the first trigger is of course the, lay, the rainfall forecast model which is then followed with an inundation model in the contamination transport model. And then also a building damage model is used to identify hotspots of expected urban flood damage. So since the inundation model is heavily, um, it needs a lot of time for computation, so it's heavily computational intense, it is not possible to follow these um, linked models in the ter term of an expected flood, but we use this inundation model and rainfall forecasts of the past to calculate a large ensemble of realistic inundation scenarios. And from these pre-calculated scenarios, then in the time of an expected event, Using an artificial neural network, the most similar scenario to the expected one is um, selected. And then we can have directly and very quickly an inundation forecast, which is then um, connected with the um, contamination ex um, expectation and the damage model. And therefore, as an output, we have in an inundation map, a damage map, and also a contamination map, which is then distributed to the potential affected people in the city via a mobile app and a mobile phone crowdsourcing activity. So now a little bit more details on the individual components. So Dr. the rate Dr. Hedy, yes. you have three minutes to complete your talk. Yes, yes, no worries. So the rainfall forecast model is uh, using station and radar rainfall measurements. So both, all what is available. And the forecast model tracks spatial temporal development of the storm cell. And it is reliable a forecast up to 30 minutes. So here we already see that urban flood forecasting is still really a challenge since already the rainfall forecasting is highly uncertain. Here we looked at one past event where we compa compared our estimate of inundation area and water depth with available information from this event. And we could identify that our um, approach with the artificial neural network was very reliable and could be used for such urban flood forecasting. 
Here we identified per building how good the water depth simulation was in comparison with the measurements and with the physically based model. And since you see here, most of the buildings have been um, predicted with very small deviations to the physical model. So our approach was quite reliable. And now here we see the final product then with the damage estimation and also contamination estimation. So these um, gray fields here are, in best, are indicating where contamination has to be expected. And the bars, the colors here um, are showing that where we have to expect um, hot spots of residential building damage. So you can imagine that if we have such information available, this is much more informative to the people than if we could only tell them how um, much precipitation they have to expect. So I come to my discussion and conclusion. So we um, are convinced that impact-based forecasting provides new possibilities for emergency management. So it will improve the emergency response by the potentially affected people, but also by the administration. The assumed benefits of impact-based forecasting are, however, until now, hardly tested. There are not really many operational systems in place and um, scientifically underpinned tests have hardly been undertaken. Problematic is, as I've already said, that uncertainties might be rather high since we, additional to the physical system, we need to consider the social system and the human behavior, as well as exposure and vulnerability estimations. Therefore, the impact uncertainty needs to be better addressed and communicated. We see a high potential in harmonizing the risk assessment and the emergency-oriented impact estimation. So if we harmonize um, these two aspects, so in the longer term precaution, but also in the emergency-oriented um, response, um, yeah, the models can be improved and also the communication, risk communication as well as early warning communication can be significantly improved. And um, this would also be um, of high value for the decision makers. A side effect is probably in science that additionally, this also fosters interdisciplinary work since um, not only metrologists dealing with the precipitation forecasting, but also hydrologists and engineers need to work together with social scientists to develop a reliable um, impact-based forecasting system for urban flooding. So I thank you for your attention. I'm not sure if we have time for a question, so I'm happy to answer if you have time. Yeah, yeah, just one brief question, sir. Miss, how, how successful it is in your country that you said the hazard forecast to impact forecast, it is very complex. So, Miss, successful because in, in India also we are planning to have some impact based forecasting. So, how success rate? means challenges already you have highlighted, but uh, what is the successful, I mean, how much successful you are in this? Yeah, I said there are not really documented tests in this respect. So this um, forecasting system, which I just presented, is indeed now operationally implemented for the city of Hanover. So this is one city in Germany where an operational system is now available. 
But unfortunately, this is one of very few cities where this is available and this is quite localized. So since its implementation, no really um, damaging urban flooding did occur in this city. So we do not know how um, yeah, successful it would be. And additionally, if we want to uh, really quantify the success, we would need some sort of comparison. So what would be the difference if you would only rely on a traditional precipitation forecast or if we have additionally an impact-based forecasting? So therefore, this is quite, quite a challenge also to um, quantify the, the advantage of such a system. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Heli. Now, I know it's a big challenge, and especially with respect sir, to the real time. Allow, sir, can I ask one technical question, sir? Uh, please, quick, quick questions, quick. Sir, actually, yeah, uh, she showed actually one kilometer radar estimate. Uh, she used in their model, and uh, DAME actually, if I, uh, I, I, uh, as far I remember in the slide, actually five minutes. Uh, how it will be uh, very much uh, for it, uh, urban flooding. This is very coarse resolution, it, it seems. Yeah, so we actually used um, precipitation forecasts together with measurements in the area, radar as well as station measurements and combined these. And the more measurements are, were um, available coming closer to the event, the more, um, the, the smaller the uncertainty was. And what we could show from this evaluation from this one event, which we pre calculated, is that this precipitation forecasting was only really reliable on a spatial scale of a kilometer. Uh, five minutes before the event. So that is really a challenge still that um, these forecasting are uh, highly uncertain, particularly in space. So it's very difficult to track the cells where to which area they are moving. Thank you. Thank you so much. Challenge lies in providing a good quality, high resolution forecast. That is a trigger for any any impact based forecasting. So so that I think the meteorological community has to has to work for. And downstream, I'm sure the impact based people will work with vulnerabilities to uh, provide a very effective impact based forecasting system. Thank you so much once again. And now we move to the third presentation. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Sivanand Pai, who has been uh, I think leading the country's initiative of the seasonal forecast and now is uh, a director of the climate institute of climate change uh, so congratulations him for taking over new assignment uh, he has been uh, see operationalizing the seasonal forecast not only within the country but also a south asian climate outlook forum and uh, also heading the regional climate center so his his from science to services is the right person to talk about the seasonal forecast, which is so important for the monsoon region because of their agrarian economy. So over to you, Dr. Pai, floor is yours. Thank you. You can see my presentation. Yes, please. Yeah. It's, it's... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I will just introduce myself and uh, my colleague, Dr. P. Srijit and uh, Surichandra Rao, who has contributed in this presentation. So, I'll uh, this map shows contribution of uh, seasonal rainfall to annual rainfall over the country. Uh, you can see this is for winter season, uh, pre-monsoon, monsoon season, and the northeast monsoon here. So, you can see that uh, not only India, most of the monsoon asian monsoon region uh, we have a 75 to 90 percentage of the annual rainfall is contributed by uh, during the southwest monsoon and uh, northeast monsoon is another important uh, uh, 
monsoon uh, rainfall season for the country but uh, rainfall is mainly in the southern part of the uh, country so therefore we can say that uh, the both the monsoon southwest and northeast monsoon dominate the annual cycle of the uh, rainfall and uh, it has got a strong influence therefore uh, to the agriculture practices of the country and uh, if we see the all india summer monsoon rainfall it has got an important uh, feature of uh, stability and regularity that means uh, ismr has been uh, within plus or minus 30 percentage of its long period average during almost all years that means it has never crossed you know except in uh, 1877 when it was around minus uh, 34 it has never gone below minus 30 or above minus 30 very uh, you know there very it shows uh, uh, its stability and further i am ismr in 70 percentage of the years was within plus or minus 10 percentage actually however if we see the more uh, you know uh, regional scale the variability is much more than all india scale and uh, uh, from this map you can see deficient years are were 25 years that is minus 10 or less than that uh, and excess years was 13 percentage which means that only 30 percentage years monsoon is either excess or uh, division and monsoon has got slight decreasing trend but uh, they are not uh, significant in fact so mostly you know the all india rainfall does not show any significant trend though there is a slight decreasing trend and in fact in recent years if we see multi decadal uh, uh, you know uh, variation in recent decade multi decades the rainfall is passing through a below normal epoch the similar was case the early part of uh, the last century you can see so monsoon also shows a multi decadal uh, variability and uh, since 2001 uh, we had a 13 below long period average years uh, within which five in deficient category but since 1994 1994 was the last year when monsoon was uh, excess thereafter we have not received any uh, you know any year when rainfall was more than 10 percentage though uh, 19 2019 was very close to you know uh, 110 percentage but otherwise uh, you know we after 94 we have not received any excess rainfall so this is showing it's a relationship with agriculture uh, main uh, crop production within the country there is a strong association of uh, summer monsoon with kharif crop with a correlation of 0.71 and even it has got uh, you know relation with rabi though correlation is only 0.38 which means that even though uh, you know monsoon rainfall uh, what uh, received in summer monsoon uh, you know that rainfall whatever received uh, the storage that can be stored and that will become helpful for the winter crops also and any significant changes in the temporal or a special distribution of the rainfall has a noticeable impact on the country's agriculture production earlier studies also have shown that indian monsoon performance has strong relation with indian gross domestic product actually but particularly when monsoon was deficient um, um, it uh, G I G D P has been affected by two to five percentage. Hence, from very beginning, prediction of a seasonal mean ISM has been uh, has a very great socio-economic importance for the country, and uh, that is why uh, since uh, uh, you know uh, establishment of I M D in eighteen seventy five, there has been attempt to predict the seasonal rainfall. So uh, I M D has been using various approaches for a seasonal forecasting uh, we uh, imd has used all kind of method available so this uh, empirical and statistical method based on uh, relationship within historical observed data uh, for the predictant and relevant predictors basically uh, you will see that historically whatever parameter that we have used uh, mainly related to enso iod uh, or uh, you know snow cover or uh, its uh, related uh, parameter has been there always in the list and uh, another method is uh, dynamical method we have uh, used uh, both initially in uh, early two th uh, 2004 and all we were using agcm for making experimental forecast was not very successful 
and uh, couple general circulation models uh, you know uh, also we have been used particularly the monsoon uh, iitm cfs model uh, monsoon mission cfs which was implemented in 2017 uh, had a you know a relatively better skill uh, among the various dynamical models and a hybrid where uh, statistical rescaling of dynamical models uh, for example iit delhi uh, you know uh, has a doing that method. So we uh, also use to generate those type of method to generate. And uh, recently, la la uh, last year, we implemented a multimodal ensemble forecasting system for generating operational forecast. Now, uh, I will give you a very brief about uh, historical uh, uh, history of a seasonal prediction uh, because uh, our aim is mainly to review various uh, approaches used in the seasonal forecast. And I will concentrate mainly on the uh, southwest monsoon rainfall because as i already said which is more important for the country rather than northeast monsoon so i will concentrate mainly on the history of operational forecast in the country uh, for a seasonal uh, for forecasting of indian summer monsoon so uh, you know history uh, seasonal prediction was started with uh, uh, you know after establishment of imd in 1875 uh, we had a, a strong Illinois in 87, 87, 88, 77, 78, 1877, 78, uh, which had a large impact uh, on India and as well as uh, North China. So Femin was uh, there, particularly eastern part of the country. Actually, that had, uh, you know, uh, because of that, that time, uh, uh, IMD's director of observatories, uh, uh, Dr. H. F. Blandford, uh, he started a tentative forecast based on uh, relationship between winter and spring snow cover falls. So it is a, just a single parameter. He thought that, uh, you know, with this uh, methodology, uh, uh, it can be because it also he also found some success in uh, during the forecast uh, during the period 82 to 85. But subsequently, uh, it did not uh, work well, though uh, in 86, uh, based on this method, uh, the first method forecast was uh, given on 4th June 1886. Subsequently, various, uh, you know, subsequently uh, some more predictors was uh, implemented uh, around the Indian region was uh, uh, introduced in the method, uh, though it was all a subjective method. It was during the Walker's time uh, who introduced the concept of correlation, who was a mathematician, well-known mathematician that time. He was the person, he was not a, a perfect meteorologist initial stage, actually. Uh, he, he implemented, used the correlation uh, method for uh, long range forecast. And uh, based on that uh, regression method, operational forecast was uh, uh, in, in, implemented in 1909. He developed a regression equation each for monsoon season for all three sub regions uh, during his time was uh, Northwest India, the southern peninsula and northeast india and uh, however basically the forecast was uh, mainly issued for peninsula and uh, northwest india uh, during the period 24 1924 to 1987 this is just to showing you the you know forecast and actual uh, relationship between uh, for peninsula and northwest india you can see the skill was almost uh, zero uh, you know almost parallel to x-axis where was a better slight skill was seen in, for in the case of northwest india so subsequently 19 uh, since 1988 and uh, during the period uh, up to 2010 several uh, statistical models were uh, implemented for the forecasting of uh, indian summer monsoon rainfall operationally uh, you can see that 1988 uh, Gavarikar et al. implemented 16 parameter model and it uh, continued up to 2002 this method and you will see that all these years monsoon was uh, basically normal and however in 2002 uh, there was a, a strong uh, uh, division monsoon year and uh, though method was further updated in 2000, uh, 2000 with the new parameters implemented. Uh, the model could not predict uh, large deficiency of uh, 2002 uh, and subsequently uh, in 2003 a two-stage forecasting system was implemented under the leadership of dr rajivan at all and based on 8 to 10 parameter models some of them parameters were from the 16 and the new parameters were uh, implemented and uh, imd also implemented uh, you know again uh, that three homogeneous regions prediction in this time 
uh, it was uh, forecast was started to give for four homogeneous rays instead of three, uh, in which was implemented in 99. And, uh, uh, you know, further kept on modifying this model in 2007. We came up with a new statistical forecasting based on statistical ensemble averaging forecasting system. And again, Rajivan et al. in 2007, you can see the paper. And uh, uh, subsequently, the forecast for monthly rainfall also was uh, implemented as a part of the long range forecasting system. This is the just a brief about the dynamical uh, system uh, uh, which was used for uh, uh, IMD. Uh, you know, operational forecast between 2004 and 2001. Uh, in 2004, as I said earlier, a seasonal forecast model, uh, which was a GCM uh, essentially, but its uh, skill was very limited. And in 2012, under monsoon mission project, uh, uh, IATM monsoon mission uh, coupled model forecast system was implemented uh, for uh, uh, IMD. And this was implemented a very high resolution, that is T382. Was, uh, uh, was transferred to IMD and we started using those uh, model. And uh, subsequently, this same model was also used for temperature forecast and uh, regional forecasting uh, for South Asia, etc. And uh, uh, last year, in addition to MMC, MM, we found that though MMC was, CFS was good and it had uh, some, uh, you know, uh, skill close to uh, statistical ensemble forecasting system and uh, the spatial of uh, you know uh, forecast the spatial uh, rainfall distribution which was uh, essentially asked by the users could not be uh, mfcfs did not have much skill so we started to use uh, uh, best few coupled model to generate uh, multimodal ensemble and uh, this was implemented in 2021 and uh, 2021 and it showed some uh, uh, you know uh, significant result and uh, will uh, imd will be using the same method for this year also so basically what i will do is uh, i will uh, uh, some of the important uh, uh, models i will be discussing quickly first is the imd seasonal forecasting system uh, based on ensemble uh, you know ensemble forecasting system which was implemented in 2007 and continued up to 2020 Though the models are run still, but as I said, MM, uh, multi-model ensemble is being used since uh, 2021. So as per the, uh, you know, uh, along with the All India rainfall based on uh, uh, EF uh, ensemble forecasting system, there were also several uh, st other statistical models for uh, uh, homogeneous region, for homogeneous region as well as monthly forecast. But you will see that those skill is uh, good uh, for all India rainfall. When you go to smaller regions and smaller time period, the skill uh, was found to be relatively limited. So this can be seen in this given in the table. Now these are the eight parameter model uh, parameters used for uh, ensemble forecasting system. The first uh, five was used for uh, April forecasting and an update which was issued in the first uh, week of June or last uh, week of May was uh, done with the uh, last six uh, uh, predictors uh, from this list. And uh, this is the schematic diagram of uh, uh, statistical ensemble forecasting system, where uh, we use five or six predictors uh, uh, corresponding to April or J June forecast. And we generate all uh, using all combination of these predictors, uh, multiple regression, as well as a projection pursuit regression models. And all these models uh, possible uh, models were combined together and uh, best few models were then uh, selected and uh, based on this uh, average of that is taken as a uh, area weighted average uh, no uh, uh, your weighted average of this model out was taken as a final forecast so this is just a performance of, uh, of you know for the period 1981 to 2020 and uh, this was the forecast you know we had given uh, for the month um, uh, year 2020 uh, you can see that uh, uh, we had given 100 and 102 but actual was 109 so since uh, it was implemented in addition to the uh, deterministic forecast we also started to give uh, five uh, category probability forecast also so this method um, had a both benefit of generating deterministic as well as a probabilistic forecast and if we see the performance of this model 
you know, since 2007, uh, you will see that uh, its uh, absolute error was only 6.6 .6 compared to 14 years earlier to that period, which is 1993 to uh, 2006. And the absolute error was almost 8%. So you can see that significant improvement or reduction in the absolute error. This is much better reflected in the correlation. You can see that 0.42 was in the period 2007 to 2020 compared to minus 0 0.47 uh, in the previous 14 years. So it clearly indicates that in recent years, the statistical ensemble forecast um, system showed significant improvement for the southwest monsoon rainfall forecast another important uh, model a statistical uh, application was to generate the forecast for monsoon onset over kerala as a you know uh, along with the monsoon rainfall and uh, this was basically still we are continuing with the statistical model based on six uh, parameter project uh, uh, you know principal uh, component regression model actually and we can see that since we started in 2005 to 2021 till last year except for 2015 when actually actual uh, onset was 5th june and we had predicted 31 may so five days different but otherwise all these years actually our forecast was within the forecast limit so there was a significant success in the uh, monsoon onset date forecast over kerala also now coming to dynamical model forecasting system this is a monsoon mission ensemble forecasting system which was implemented, uh, uh, you know, established in IITM, uh, which was uh, developed from NSEP USA uh, with model resolution was 100, 100 kilometer. However, in 2016, uh, IITM uh, Pune developed a new version with a higher resolution of 36 kilometer. And uh, IMD started to prepare experimental forecast for monsoon rainfall. You can see that MMCFS uh, in this uh, Taylor diagram have a, a you know better skill than any other uh, coupled model uh, of that time actually and uh, uh, in 2017 this model was uh, transferred to imd and we are still running that uh, for our regional climate services and also to generate enso forecast uh, every month with a monthly update and uh, this is the performance of the uh, model uh, in the hindcast period and uh, Dr. The, uh, yeah uh, yes, sir. I'm I'm just speaking. Okay, so this is just a MME which we had implemented last year. Uh, basically, this was uh, implemented mainly because uh, users want not only the deterministic forecast, also they wanted a, a special distribution of uh, rainfall. So uh, this method was used to generate probabilistic forecast for monthly as well as seasonal or uh, two uh, by bi monthly etc. So several uh, new uh, models, uh, you know, uh, forecast were done with this model. I will quickly go to, uh, I will not explain because of lack of time. Uh, this is uh, the method, uh, MME method that we used. These are the models, eight models we had used. And some of the best models were selected to generate uh, MME. And this was done, uh, selection was done based on CC, RMSC, uh, uh, index of uh, uh, agreement, uh, etc. And, uh, you know, uh, here you can see that uh, comparison to single model of CFS and MMCFS, MME had a better, uh, in a most part, uh, uh, better CC uh, and also RMSC was less compared to the other model. You can see particularly the monsoon tough region, which has got significant contribution to the total monsoon rainfall over the country and uh, index of uh, uh, agreement shows you know much better the show, showing that relation uh, mme has got much better skill than the uh, cfs or mmcfs so this is uh, just uh, you know based on uh, march ic uh, in hindcast you can see that uh, this is uh, model was able to predict uh, deficient as well as uh, excess monsoon rainfall and uh, the important point is that mme has got uh, less absolute error than both uh, statistical as well as uh, you know other two uh, important uh, coupled model uh, also we also had an update in may i see uh, uh, as we are giving a update forecast so here also you can see that uh, may i see had a bit much better uh, skill than uh, march i see and uh, here also uh, in the forecast mode you can see that uh, uh, in the SCFS, it has it is much better than SCFS. Though all India, 
all the single model as well as MME and the statistical model shows a almost a closer relationship. When you go to a spatial distribution, MME performs much better. These are uh, for uh, two above normal years, uh, no, uh, below normal years, 14 and 2015, where MME has got a much better uh, category I forecast than MMCFS. Same is the situation 2019 and 2020 uh, above normal rainfall. Uh, MME performed much better than individual model. And the uh, last two slides, sir. And uh, last year, uh, you can see that this was uh, probability category forecast, uh, you know, ob observed rainfall category uh, and March IC forecast and May IC forecast. You can see that in many areas, uh, MME uh, is able to, you know, uh, give, provide you much better than, uh, you know, like uh, though. Uh, exactly everywhere it may not be, but overall you will see that this model not only gives you deterministic forecast uh, last year gave uh, correctly and the spatial distribution also was good. So finally, the conclusion, since the first operational forecast in ATHTX, IMD has used various approaches to generate operational forecast for ISMR. Traditionally, IMD has been using indigenously developed statistical models with regular update and improvement. Uh, SEFS showed uh, improved skill in the operational during the last uh, uh, almost 14 years compared to previous years. And uh, however, it has got a limited skill, particularly when you want to uh, predict uh, spatial distribution uh, of a rainfall, which actually uses uh, want. So that has actually resulted in the implementation of MMCFS. After experimenting this last uh, few years, uh, we implemented that last year. The newly implemented multi-model approach has better skill in the prediction of monsoon rainfall over India compared to individual dynamical model used to build MME as well as compared to SEFS. However, there is a further scope for improvement of skill of the seasonal forecasting, particularly over smaller regions. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pai, for bringing out the evolution of seasonal forecasting. India was first country to start is way back in 1890s and uh, thereafter there had been uh, improvement uh, both in space and temporal scales as you have brought out with the multi multimodal and simple forecasts. Uh, thank you so much and uh, we are running uh, behind the time so uh, we may not have question answers per se but uh, I'll encourage all participants to get in touch with you if they have got anything to ask. Thank you, Dr. Pai. Uh, it's Thank important. You, Thank you for the opportunity. Thank it, you. Is, it is a very important area for monsoon regions, not only for India, but um, entire South Asia and adjoining uh, regions. Thank you so much. And finally, to the last presentation uh, is from Dr. Patnaik, who needs no introduction. Uh, he has been working tirelessly to organize this, this particular workshop monsoon workshop so well organized he is actively involved uh, with the sister institutions of iitm and ncmrwf to develop a operational extended range forecasting and uh, issuing uh, regular updates um, for the for the user community so he is the right man to bring out uh, the application of monsoon forecast in the agriculture over to you, yes, Dr. Patnaik. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, I just now I'm sharing my PPT. Dr. Patnaik, yeah. you have to manage your time. Yeah, yes, I, have, I manage my time. Yes. Okay. So, is a slide visible, sir, now? Yes, it is. Okay. So yeah, I will be talking about the medium and extended forecast and application in agriculture. So seasonal forecast already you have heard. Okay, so now here, if you see here, um, the, uh, the already I will not give much introduction, but how the medium and extended range forecast are being generated here, particularly for the application of agriculture. And I will give some of the examples here. So in this case, if you see here, the high resolution models for particularly the medium range forecast, that is GFS 1534 12 kilometer and the global ensemble forecast system at all similarly at 12 kilometer and it is run four times a day and at GFS 12, two times a day. So this is particularly for the medium range forecast. In addition, recently with the support of all our MOS institutions, we have implemented 
uh, the couple model for the uh, extended effort class. So that every alternative we run it for next uh, four weeks, and we uh, that is a bias corrected uh, GFS and CFS combined. That I will show. And let us first come to the MME best forecast to based on the medium range. Since we are using the agriculture advisory every twice a week based on this uh, our output, so we have recently introduced the five model uh, uh, MME based on uh, whatever all the GFS, GEFS, and sub GFS unit UM model from NCM lab and also global structural model from GMA. So the five models are considered here. And I will come to here just for some example how it is. Uh, you can see the rainfall district wise. We are calculating the district wise because the advisory, farmer advisory are needed for the, at the district level, very district level. So, yes, this is one case how based on 4 September, the rainfall day one to day five forecast. And whenever it is high rainfall, bent other, it is indicated with the threshold value, indicated with red, red color. And uh, if you see the scale of this one for 2021 monsoon, See, yes, here if you can see here how the day one forecast from individual model as well as MME score. And uh, this is day two forecast and day three, day four for day five forecast are there. So what here it indicates that see, MME rainfall forecast is high compared to the individual model up to five days. This is very good that uh, MME forecast is always higher skill, having higher skill compared to individual model. R RFSC and MME rainfall is less than individual model forecast up to day five. This is root mean square error is less. Generally, under prediction of high rainfall event. So, this also is very clear, though we are taking the average over the district, but it is underestimated in case of high rainfall event. Whenever high rainfall event, that is uh, underestimated uh, in all, all the model and all, also in the MMA. Special distribution, this is also more important because India is a big country. So, we have to have the better skill all over the India, then only the, at district level it can be utilized for the any application purpose. So here, if you see the different model, CC, RMSC, and BIAS, these are the three scores are used for 2021 monsoon. And this is the MME. If I highlight that the MME, you can see it is much bigger, higher skill over spreading over most part of India. So that is a good sign. Similarly, the RMSC also less, and uh, BIAS also is less. So this this is the that means how encouraging signal we are getting from the MME in the medium range so that we can utilize it for the uh, our uh, agro advisory services that i will explain in my later part of the talk coming to the extended range this is a joint collaborative system from iitm and sound lab imd and also in quest the ocean assimilation so that is implemented before that we are uh, having mme and we started this extended range forecast. I am not giving the historical perspective here because of lack of time. But yes, recently 2017 onwards, we are running this every weekly. And Heinkas run CFS to a true resolution and GFS bias corrected after the CFS running over 16 total 16 ensemble. And then this is forecast and this is similarly the Heinkas. So in 2021 case, Heinkas is for 2003 to 2020. And every third day we are preparing the forecast. And this is a skill of the All India rainfall skill for the uh, week one to week four forecast. If you can during the last monsoon season, yeah, the peak rainfall September, June, and slightly normal below normal in August, it is well predicted. That means uh, whenever the signal is very low, that means it is sometimes not captured. But yes, most of the thing uh, having high CC. So the All India skill. But as I mentioned, this India is a very big country. So for application purpose, actually for application in agriculture, we have to have the district level. We are talking about the district level. So this is just a skill I am just showing for the uh, particular case of two, um, two episodes when we, we spell a little bit and, uh, and the little bit better scale. So this is object rainfall anomaly and this is a forecast with that for week one, week two, week three. So that means three week lead time, this anomaly are well predicted. Similarly, the dry phase of monsoon also at least one or two, three weeks. Uh, Central India, it is also uh, relatively well predicted. That means uh, this extended range forecast skill also having good skill, particularly for two to three weeks. So in order to have the idea about the district level, so if you give the district 36 mat subdivisions are there, then further sub, uh, if you downscale, it is the district about 676 district we have considered. And then we categorize it, means above normal, normal or below normal. So we have, our target is to capture the category in the our prediction prediction case so this is how week one 
this is the when the category matching correct category partially correct that means one out and totally wrong so this if you see week one it is very good week two also partially correct also good uh, yeah okay then uh, we when we come to week two forecast this we say correct category very nice and uh, this is about 30 40 percent so this way we have only go to wrong forecast also about 20 25 percent it is not much uh, uh, other correct to partial correct it is 70 to 75 percent in the most cases so considering this one when we see the actual uh, for the average for the entire season this is the, that this is what we got means the region wise it is different again district level over the region wise means your northwest india having little better skill central india also having slightly better skill but northeast india is having slightly lower skill okay for all india this is the, okay this way we are getting the skill so at least uh, our as analysis indicate that we can utilize this up to two weeks with a reasonable accuracy for particularly the application purpose. So this is the summary what I have shown the figure. Make in Miss CFS2, it means two or 20 and 2020 monsoon when we analyze for 36 subdivision and uh, district level. I've got good skill at least for the interseasonal variation. It has captured very well and also it is matching uh, means about 70 75 percent. It is category wise matching. Then then come volumetric infected capacity model so that uh, this inputs are provided from the extended forecast the maximum temperature minimum temperature rainfall wind so then it is uh, in initialized the so and uh, we generate the soil moisture runoff of this forecast so that that is a land surface parameters are very much generated and uh, every week using this forecast uh, uh, our erf extended forecast product so that is given input to the hydrological model and uh, then we prepare this one soil moisture and uh, runoff and also the anticipated change means what is the what are the conditions in the previous week and how the expected uh, changes are going to occur in the next week so this so two weeks here also we restrict our analysis for the two weeks to see how this changes in the soil moisture runoff so that this can be useful for giving the guidance for the farmer. Now the coming to the advisory, farmer's advisory. So when we are having the right skill of the medium range and extended range, these are very much it is used for giving the advisory by our agromet units. So, so here they took uh, the medium range forecast for five parameters for five days, rainfall, maximum temperature, minimum temperature, humidity, wind, along with that the previous observation wind and all these conditions, the soil conditions are taken and the agreement expect they our take our forecast for two weeks and issue the advisory farmer to advisory to the farmer. So this is just case how we say two thousand case here. If we this is a two week forecast at mat, uh, sorry match subdivision level and when we come to down uh, district level it is like the red is means below normal and uh, large deficient yellow but the other thing is normal and when blue is above normal. So this way we give the um, uh, forecast generated from the extended range and this is used for the issue of the advisory so advisory when they issue the advisory they consider all these points previous observations as i was showing in the previous slides observations and your forecast at different level the soil conditions okay and accordingly the medium and extended forecast are combined and the uh, farmers are uh, provided with the advisory I'll just give you one example that 5 to 9 June 2021, the day one, day two, I see. When the day to day basis up to five day, we provide this one and that is given and extended forecast based on uh, other parameters, they give you outlook. So the, then the farmers are given the advice what to do or not to do. Like plantation of crop should not be done until sufficient amount of rainfall is received. That means when the rainfall is dry phase is there or something, you are not expected to get rainfall in that particular area, then they will advise like this. Similarly, when it is very active case, means active case, this means, uh, your 18th to 22nd July, very run for, run for surplus. In that case, they also give advisory management practices should be done to drain out excess amount of water from soybean, sorghum, sugarcane, like this. So this, this way, forecast observations are combined and it is uh, give, uh, given for uh, our uh, issuing the advisory. So it is not only the district level, med subdivision level, the uh, rainfall, even we also do the calculation for the temperature. Because temperature also, as we have seen. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir, last slide. 
so this is the dc level temperature and temperature for whenever warming it is also uh, given the uh, according to so economic impact this is yes there is a study so economically when somebody using our farmers are using this economic advice sorry our farmer advisory they are getting benefited so that that means most of the farmers are also using this advisory and also it is cost effective that means it is benefited financial benefited so in summary this is my summary i have already highlighted this thing mme based district level forecast provides useful skill up to five days in medium range that is very well the implementation and operation of couple modeling system at imd has led to the improvement of extended range forecast to provide services to various sectors so various sectors extended range also is there and when we are integrating the era products is showing useful skill two to three weeks and in products are being prepared routinely for application in agriculture and for providing advisory to the farmer the advisory to farmer issued based on medium and extended forecast has large economic benefits so that also based on the survey i think sir we, i yeah i finished this thing uh, without uh, taking much time thank you very much thank sir. you thank you thank you dr patnaik and i'm really happy to see the progress being made in this uh, important area of extended range forecasting because for agrarian operations uh, active break cycles uh, two to three weeks period advance forecasts are very useful and uh, it's it's a partnership with the itm and ncmrw fincois is been of uh, great value so uh, i am sure the, the the targeted products which you are developing uh, for the soil moisture and and various advisories are of great value has brought out the economic benefits and uh, i'm sure with improvement in the forecast models uh, the extended range predictions okay sir so, thank you very much sir for uh, uh, nicely conducting the session actually just we are just behind by five minutes but that is okay it happened so but other all four talks were very nice and uh, thank you sir also yeah, you conducted the session and managed that time efficiently so with this thing we just uh, conclude our invited talk session and in just five minutes from now we will start the our parallel session hall a and hall b just just another five minutes so this is hall a so those yeah, who are here please remain yeah, here doctor sorry dr patna i i think i i had some network problem so i'd like to thank all for invited yeah. speakers yeah uh, for bringing out uh, the applications as as well as the a forecast both at the climate uh, projections because of the aerosols and seasonal forecast and application of urban forecasting and agriculture thank you so much uh, there were some time constraints but i think you managed very well all all four speakers thank you so much thank, thank you thank you, thank you very much sir yes you also co concluded very nicely and also summarized the talk so thank you thank you sir for nice year. so we'll be back now in uh, just Three four minutes from now, so this is this will be hall A, and uh, we have yeah five to six talks are there, and uh, hall B will be in other link. So we will start in a three four minutes from now. Okay, just be. Here.
तो सर तो सर so uh, welcome to uh, the hall a of this parallel session uh, so today uh, we have uh, two uh, parallel session of uh, this is 24th second time of the day we are having parallel session so uh, this session will be coordinated by uh, dr nichiketa acharya uh, he is uh, welcome to me but today uh, he is attending this uh, from uh, us uh, now presently in uh, florida uh, sorry pennsylvania psu as nachigata yes yes so anyhow he is uh, one of the uh, brightest uh, scientist uh, in, in the field of uh, climate modeling so he completed is a phd here uh, and uh, what uh, uh, did lot of novel work on uh, climate modeling and for the forecasting of monsoon basically uh, for extended range forecasting which is very much useful in uh, agro services so his uh, tools are still used in meteorological department so that way uh, he contributed a lot in uh, this uh, uh, climate modeling for monsoon so nachiketa now it's over to you to uh, coordinate this whole session uh, thank you dr das uh, uh, and one thing is that uh, please maintain uh, the time because some people are joining uh, uh, late in night and another uh, thing is that questions may be asked directly from the uh attendee of the session through web like webex link but some of the questions may come from the live youtube uh, channel so that will be passed to you by the uh, organizer so that way uh, please uh, look at uh, the questions in, on the chat box as well uh okay so now can we start the session sure thank you thank you dr das uh, as we are a little late so uh, no further delay I invite the first uh, speaker, Dr. Kate Salmon, and uh, the talk. The time is ten minutes, so the way I will give the warning. Uh, I will open my video around nine minutes, so that you can get a, that you have one minute, and you know wrap up in a minute. Great. The screen is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, I will just share my screen. Just let me know whether you can see the slides. Yes, we can see the full screen. And Go you ahead. can hear me. Great. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming to my talk. Um, so today I'll be, um, I'm Kate Salmon, Dr. Kate Salmon from the Met Office. Um, uh, I've been working on um, looking at verifying seasonal forecast models over the South Asia region. Um, and I'm presenting this work on behalf of one of my colleagues, Jessica Stacey. Uh, so this work was conducted under the Asia Regional Resilience to a Changing Climate Programme, which was funded by the UK aid budget. And uh, we've conducted it in collaboration with partners in the region, um, primarily focusing on four different countries, so Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Obviously, the whole of the South Asia region was also um, was also looked at. So the aim of uh, and the motivation behind the study, well, in 2017, the WMO conducted a review of the regional climate outlook forum processes across the world, and they concluded that they needed uh, 
there needed to, there was a need for more objective seasonal forecast process uh, in in these climate outlook forums. And the South Asia Seasonal Climate Outlook Forum was selected as a pilot to demonstrate good practices based on objective seasonal forecasting. Um, so this, uh, this study is really feeding into making the SASCOF a more objective process in line with the WMA recommendations. So this study, um, so the method that was used for model verification, we looked at 12 different seasonal uh, models uh, alongside uh, the CHIRPS observation data set, which is a blended uh, in situ station data with um, satellite data uh, for a hindcast period of 1993 to 2016. And we compared uh, these with uh, teleconnection indices such as the Ocean Nino Index and the Indian Ocean Dipole. Uh, we did this for the region as a whole, so the whole of the South Asia region, excluding the Maldives, as that was not um, covered by the CHIRPS observation data set, but also for national level countries, uh, which were under, covered under the ARC programme, which I've mentioned previously. Um, for two different seasons, so uh, we did it for the southwest monsoon as well as the northeast monsoon period, uh, and we looked at different metrics including Pearson's correlations, rock scores, reliabil reliability and sharpness diagrams. Uh, just for brevity, I will be just talking about Pearson's correlations in this talk, so essentially how well the models represent the observations. Um, when we looked at this, we found there was a huge amount of spatial variability. So um, looking just here at the southwest on scene, you can see on the right hand side, the 12 different model outputs. So this is the Pearson's correlations, um, which uh, are looking at how well the models represent the observations. And anything above 0.4, so anything that's dark green is statistically significant. So you can see um, that the precipitation, the monsoon precipitation is captured really well over central and northern areas of India, um, but is a lot more variable further east, for instance, over Bangladesh. And we're proposing this is to do with um, the drivers of the precipitation. So um, the monsoon precipitation over central and northern areas of India are uh, um, driven predominantly by El Nino, whereas over uh, the east, uh, so over Bangladesh, uh, the, the monsoon precipitation is predominantly driven by low depression systems from the Bay of Bengal. And these intra-seasonal intra effects are much more difficult to capture um, in the models. And again, if we look at the winter monsoon, um, it's a different pattern emerges over the region as a whole. So there's weaker correlation over areas with little rainfall, such as Nepal, um, and again, it's central northern India as well. Whereas you do see a more significant correlation um, over areas which receive more rainfall in this season, such as Afghanistan and Pakistan. And if we look at the, um, if we compare the models, uh, so if we rank the models in terms of how um, statistically significant they are, um, you can see for the region as a whole, um, there are the top models of CMCC, GEM Nino and ECS5. And these models, if we look in, um, in, in specific domains such as Pakistan, CMCC, GEM Nino and EC5 do, do represent Pakistan quite well. Um, but in Bangladesh, they're very low on the rankings in terms of where they sit. And this really highlights the benefits of tailoring a model skill assessment to individual country domains, as well as potentially using a multi-model ensemble to make informed decisions about model selection rather than just selecting one or two models um, for your specific domain. Um, we also discovered that, well, it's, it's known already, but um, the influence of the NSA signal on model skill. So here we looked at the relationship between um, the ONI index and the model skill in the southwest one scene. So if you look at the x-axis, just take that as a proxy for model skill and the y-axis taking it as a proxy for the ONI index. 
this negative correlation between the ONI and precipitation corresponds to a higher model skill in the southwest monsoon. And this is um, this is also echoed by the Nepal domain, which you would um, anticipate as that precipitation is driven by ENSO during this southwest monsoon. Whereas if we look at the other regions, um, the other domains within the region, um, we found that ENSO, the NSA, the NSA teleconnection has less influence on model skill. And if we do the same for the northeast monsoon, um, overall, the, over the entire region, there is no overall regional pattern. So if you look at the South Asia um, graph in the top left, you see there's no regional pattern overall. Where, where, and again, if we looked, look at Nepal, which did have a significant correlation in the southwest monsoon, there's not really any correlation in the winter. Whereas places like Bangladesh suggest that models with higher NSA values have greater skill in the winter monsoon. Um, but interestingly, areas such as Afghanistan and Pakistan have a, di a different relationship, so a different sign um, in the winter monsoon. And we also discovered that so the, 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 the skill was highly season seasonally variable. So for instance, if we look at Nepal in the summer monsoon, we can see that these three models are the top performing models for Nepal. Whereas we look at those very models in the winter monsoon, and we see that they rank a lot lower. Um, similarly, if we look at Pakistan, um, these are the top three models for the winter monsoon. And in the summer, these three models rank very differently. So it's, we also discovered it's very important to select models based not just on the domain, but also the time of year that you're looking, um, what, that you're looking at. So overall, uh, we discovered there's a large spatial variability between the model correlations and skill, and that was predominantly driven by the NC sig signal. So areas which had higher model skill tended to be areas which had a more a stronger NC signal um, compared to areas where precipitation was driven by intra-seasonal variability such as the monsoon trough and uh, low pressure systems uh, that there was large seasonal differences in model skill and again that is related to the strength of uh, the NSA connection in each each season and again domain differences so again related to the strength of NSA connection in, in each uh, of the different domains so the next steps for the work, uh, well, the report for, of this, which has a lot more details than I'm able to talk through here, as well as the other verification metrics, is currently available on the ARC website, and there's a link to it here. Alternatively, you can scan the QR code now with your phone, and it should just take you straight to that report. Um, this report's being currently written up into an academic paper in collaboration with the partners that we've worked with in the region. Um, we're also writing up some country-specific guidance based on different seasons and domains. So um, some countries have precipitation dominating at different times of year, not just in the southwest, uh, not just in JJAS and um, OND. So we're we're concentrating on looking at what seasons matter to them and how that would affect their, mo their model selection. Um, there's a potential to add different variables um, depending on which sector is interested. So at the moment, we have just looked at precipitation, but there, there is potential to look at temperature, for instance. But overall, the, the um, and, and also the work could um, include some multi-model ensemble combinations. So experimenting with which models, uh, which model combinations perform best, both regionally and nationally. Um, but yeah, that's that's the end of my talk. So please, um, I, inv I invite questions or alternatively, you can con contact either myself or my colleague, Tammy James on the email addresses below. Thank you very much. Oh, Thank you very much, Great. It was great and within the time. So any <laughs> good. 
any quick question from the audience or from the YouTube? Uh, if not, I have a, a, go ahead, please. Oh, please go ahead. Oh, yeah. So uh, excellent, you know, because we are part of SASCOV and we see the importance of the study. A quick comment. Uh, do you ever try with the new data set by uh, IMD, which is prepared for the SASCOV country, which is a blend of chips and all the other data set from each individual countries? Did you ever try this study with that data? Oh, we haven't tried that yet, um, but we're very open to this work being adapted to include different data sets. Um, so the original work uh, did have older seasonal models and I've updated them in the last two months, actually. So, yeah, if it, very happy to look at um, more up to date data. Great. And see you in the letter of the month in Saskov. Yeah. So, <laughs> OK. So the next speaker, uh, Dr. Faber Francis, please take the screen. And uh, again, in nine minutes, I'll be on so that you have one minute to wrap up. The screen is yours, Dr. Faber. Do we have the speaker with us? Uh, Admin, do you have the video or something of her talk? Uh, not sure of it. Uh, we don't have it. So I think we can move to the next one. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, we don't have the presentation. Now. We didn't receive the presentation from uh, Angur Srivastava. Yeah, sure. I cordially invite Dr. Srivastava, Dr. Angur. Uh, so now we have a little more time. <laughs> so let's keep but, but keep in a 10 minutes. Go ahead, please. Uh, hi, so I'm my name's Richard Keen. I'm going to be doing this talk. Is that uh, it's sort of joint work between uh, me and Anchor? I'm just trying to find oh, the yeah. window. Um, so, uh, sure. oh, I thought I could. I'll try sharing screen. Good. Yeah. So, can you see that? Okay. Yeah, I can see, but uh, yeah, make it full screen, please. Full screen. Uh, does that work okay? Yes, although it's actually in. Oh, it's in the presenter, yeah. Yeah, in the presenter mode, yeah. Okay, I'll try. I'll see if I can. Sorry about this. Yeah. Yeah, when I tested it, I had to share just the window. So um, I can't. Um, You see it now. It's coming. It's not yet. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. It was um. It wasn't coming up as an option, so I just restarted it. Is that showing now? No. Okay. Sir, if you want, uh, we can share from our end.
Yeah, we, we can, can see, see now. Yes, sir. Now making the full screen. So it got unshared, so please share again. Okay. I think I've got internet issues. It might, maybe it's best if you share it. Sorry about this. I'm not seeing any of the video. I'll stop my video. Um, I'll try that. Uh, sir, and then we will share from our end. Is it okay? Okay. Okay. I'm sharing, sir. Okay. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so I've I've done a few updates since this, but I can go go through them verbally, so that's okay. Um, so this is, yeah, this is some joint work between me and Enka Srivastava. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge Jill Martin, who's helped with this. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Um, Can you go to the next slide, Admin? Oh, thanks. Yeah. So I'll just this this has got a few steps in it. We can go through them. That's okay. Um, so basically, so, so we're looking at um, seasonal timescales and focusing on precipitation biases. Um, so the first element of this slide, I'm just showing the region that we looked at that we're specifically focusing on, and um, this is a, quite an old plot, but it's of of a climate a bias in the climate simulation. That so the red is just where there's not enough precipitation and. Uh, that's just how we've defined our region. So this is the specific region we're looking at. It's based on this long-standing bias in the unified model, in the Met Office model. Um, in the climate simulation, we're looking at, at that on slightly shorter timescales, so looking at seasonal timescales. So if you click on, yeah. So um, so we're looking at these hindcasts. So in, in practice, um, these are used to for post-processing. So these biases in the operational seasonal forecast are calibrated out, but it's but studying these is a good chance to um, to investigate more about the biases in the model. So if you go on to the next one, um, so yes, yeah, so we basically. So if, if you imagine these are all the forecasts we're looking at, um, or hindcast, hindcast valid in June, July, and August. Um, so for a given uh, lead time, which is one of these squares along the forecast, if you click on, then it will come up with that. Um, that thank you. Yeah. So. Um, so for each lead time, um, you get a, a set of um, valid forecasts in that period. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, yeah. So for Glossy 5, this is the UM, um, initialized during November to August, um, and that's initialized four days each month. So um, we're looking at things as a function of lead time, so things gradually vary. Uh, so, so yeah, different different periods in, in the different dates within the period for each lead time. Um, and then for CFS, so uh, so that that's we're looking at the period two thousand two to twenty fifteen. Um, so and anchors applied the method to CFS version two, um, which used ITM, and this this has slightly different dates. And so far, um, we're missing um, forecasts initialized in June, July, and August. So for the shortest lead times, we've not got uh, quite so many forecasts. Um, and the the dates are slightly different, but over, overall, um, you can make a comparison. Um, so if you go on to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, so this is what um, what it looks like. Um, it's a function of forecast lead time, looking at all the dates. So um, in, in Glossy 5, um, the, the, the bias reduces quite quickly early on um, and then tails off. Um, and then 
um, in CFS, um, uh, it, it's although it gets to the same bias. So the, these are these two plots are lined up. Um, you get roughly the same bias towards the end. Um, uh, this bias seems to take a bit longer to come. So um, this initial behavior, this low values in CFS, are because of the um, because we've only got um, valid times early in the season. So so actually the precipitation should be lower. Um, so if you can click through the uh, text elements, uh, sorry, the net, that's it, yeah. Um, and then so for glossy, there's also some evidence for recovery um, during days 20 to 30. Um, but actually, um, this, when when you um, plot the same with, with, with glossy without these June, July, August forecasts, you actually get, um, you actually get similar behavior early on. So similar um, similar increase with precipitation. It's just the precipitation increasing as you bring in lead valid times in later in June and into July and August. Um, so it's interesting, you get the same bias, but it, it sort of develops much later in, in CFS. So you go on to the next slide. Yeah, so um, we looked at the variation with BSISO phase. Um, and so, yeah, that's it. Yeah, so with glossy, um, uh, you get this. Uh, so, so the, this was a way of just uh, dividing the period in, into um, different categories. Um, and so, yeah, uh, so you get active phases, um, sort of four and five, and then active to break phases are six and seven. And uh, the, in the NWP forecast, the UM seems to perform a bit better for these phases. And that's sort of what you see here, the initial um, errors aren't so bad um, so focusing on the left um, and then um, as the forecast develops um, it sort of just sort of regresses to, to a, a single value so the, these are based on BSISO phases observed BSISO phases um, and so um, as, as the model progresses this becomes less relevant to the model states so the model sort of loses information about this this observed phase um, so that becomes less relevant so actually the bias um, compared to observations it just depends on what the phase should be doing um, so if we go on to the next slide this shows them all together um, so yeah cfs ones by the yeah they look quite fair they don't vary so much with phase so um so this is where i plotted all the phases together and um you can see this coming together it takes about 50 or 60 days maybe a bit longer with cfs and so that gives you an idea of how how long the model sort of um uh, can uh, simulate this these this bsiso um the differences are much less uh they they it varies less with uh, bsiso phase in cfs but that could be because we've only got uh, so at the beginning of the forecast we've not got all these um valid times um, another thing to notice with glossy, if um, if you can see the colours that phases six, seven, and eight um, the, um, as, are um, co consistently higher throughout the period. So although I say the um, the model um, sort of loses information about this BSISO phase, um, it does seem to uh, there does seem to be some de dependence. So it'll be interesting to see if that's statistically significant. Um, so the, these phases six, seven, and eight, which is actually where the um, weather numerical weather prediction forecast is less bad in the UM. Um, th this bias is is less bad; it's still there, but um, so it's it'll be interesting to see whether that's significant or not. Um, so yeah, if you go on to the next slide, yeah. So I've summarised all that on on this. So it's probably easier just to click through all these. Um, so the both systems do have a in different initial behavior for different phases, but this is this is more the case with with glossy. But that may be because um, because it's not uh, uh, because we, we've got more uh, valid times. Something I didn't go into, but in glossy, the the progression of the bias in the second eight days is actually slightly shifted in phase um, compared with that in the first eight days. So whereas um, it was phases of uh, six five six and seven that weren't so bad um in the first eight days it's more like four five and six um that weren't so bad in in the second eight days um 
And yeah, so as uh, so yeah, I've mentioned that over the first 50 days, um, behavior of CFS has rather less phase dependence than that of glossy. Um, and then both systems tend to a value that's roughly independent of phase. Um, and this perhaps takes is slightly quicker in glossy, even though it starts off with more dependence. Um, and these long lead time values for glossy do look to be, there does seem to be a slight increase for phases five to eight. So that's something we've got ensembles and, and a longer period we can look at. Um, and then just to make once again the point, so that it make clear the caveat that the um, forecasts um, that start during June to August haven't been evaluated here in CFS. So, um, and that that's probably why we get that is why we get these lower values at shorter lead times. Um, and so, something relates to that that I've done with Glossy on the next slide. So this is the variation. Um, so if we go back to the previous, yeah, or the, that one, yeah. So, um, so this is where I've looked at the variation with time of year. Um, and I've split this period, it's June, July, August, it's 92 days, so there's roughly nine decades, which are just 10 day periods across the season. Um, and so you can see the progression, so the, the black lines are, are the observed values, and the green lines are the um, variation with forecast lead time. Um, you can see the, the variation throughout the time of years, the black line is a bit lower in, uh, in, in June and gradually increases and then decreases slightly into August. Um, so all, yeah, all times of year do show this fairly large initial reduction. Um, but whereas early in the year, the reduction continues throughout the forecast, um, later in the year, um, there's less reduction and sometimes even a recovery. Um, and this is interesting because it's consistent with studies on, on climate simulations. So, um, these have less of a low precipitation bias uh, later in the year in the UM compared to atmosphere only simulations. Um, so what seems to be happening is there's some process uh, going on in, in the coupling. Um, so if you, if, so coming later in the year for these decades, uh, sort of seven, eight and nine, um, if you start your forecast, if, if you have too short a range, um, you, you still get that initial drop um, and then it doesn't get time to recover. But if you have, if you start earlier, you get you get the initial drop, and then this this coupling process seems to allow um, the forecast to recover. Um, so, so that's consistent with the climate simulation. And I, I've just got a slide on some possible next steps. Um, yeah, so we'll go through these. So, um, so obviously we need to fill in these June to August initializations, um, and the next one. Um, and then we've also got, um, so I have done this, we've got um, earlier hind cast back to 1993 and there's not too much difference when you use these earlier hind casts. Um, so the, the, the next step will be to test the robustness of these results using statistical analysis and in particular looking at this remaining phase dependence at the longer lead times. Um, and then I've done some work applying the analysis to newer systems. And it might also be interesting to look at there's there's coarser resolution um, CFS runs. Um, and then another thing is rather than using these observed BSISO phases to use actually a measure of what the model thinks it is. And it might that might make more sense to use a, a simpler ISO type measure um, that's just based on uh, sort of uh, filtering the precipitation. So seeing what the model thinks it should be doing on larger scales um, and then just to make clear we, we haven't forgotten that we need to look at this spatial behavior using maps um, so one thing the relevant region might be slightly different for CFS um, and we could also extend this to look at other regions so the equatorial Indian Ocean has a has a wet bias to the south certainly in the in glossy in, in the UM so that might be something to look at as well so thank you for that sorry for the technical problems um, but thanks for going through the slides Thank you, Dr. Richard, and really interesting work. Pro the process with diagnostic is really important. Uh, any any quick question from the audience and from the YouTube? Okay, if not, then I will invite the next speaker, Thank Dr. Adars Kumar. Please go ahead, share your screen, please. Dr. Adars Kumar. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you. Yeah. Just wait. Sir.
Please, Dr. Kuma, please share your screen. Yeah. Uh, slide is visible, sir? Yes, please make it full screen. Yeah, definitely. Yes, please go ahead and you have 10 minutes. So I'll pop up my video after nine minutes. So we have one minute for wrap up. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Thank you, sir, for inviting me for this talk. The uh, title of my um, talk is a study of atmospheric uh, electrical conductivity during monsoon season at a tropical station of Northern India. I am from uh, Amity Institute of Applied Sciences, Amity University, Uttar Pradesh, Noida. So, uh, my area uh, deals with atmospheric electricity. So, it involves lightning, cosmic rays, and other things. So this uh, slide shows the great scientist, Benjamin Franklin, who did a, who means pioneer in this area. Now, first I saw the variation of uh, different layers, variation of uh, altitude versus temperature in different layers of atmosphere. The different layers are troposphere, stratosphere, uh, uh, mesosphere, a thermosphere. Uh, although, uh, uh, topopass, mesopass are, are also shown. These are the uh, top boundaries. So in this figure, uh, chemosphere and ionosphere is also shown. So um, uh, most of the electrical phenomena take place in the troposphere. Now this is the uh, this is one of the important uh, figure in uh, which shows the which shows how the atmospheric electrical phenomena takes place uh, in the troposphere. So in this figure, uh, troposphere is shown where the electrical phenomenon takes, takes place. Middle atmosphere is also shown. So on the right hand side, how the storm currents are generated, it is shown in this uh, figure. Ionosphere, magnosphere is also shown. Now this figure uh, shows the, uh, shows the, shows the uh, generation of uh, different ions in the atmosphere because uh, we know that Air consists of uh, charged particles. This, these may be positive and negative. So in case of fair, fair weather, there are some uh, atmospheric electrical elements like as uh, current density, electrical conductivity, potential gradient, and columnar resistance. But in the disturbed weather, there are some sources of the ions like as precipitation, point currents, and lightning, which add ions to, uh, ions, uh, to the fair weather. That's why the atmosphere electrical uh, conduct electric parameters are changed so cosmic rays from the sun is also one of the source of the ions in the uh, in, in in the atmosphere moreover radon gas which is emitted from the uranium and others it is also one of the source now this figure shows how the atmosphere electrical parameters they influence our our uh, cloud system so they uh, they modify the microphysics of the cloud system. Yes. So these are the typical parameters of the fair weather atmosphere electrical circuit. So electric field is around 120 volt per meter. Current density is 3 pico ampere per meter square. Air conductivity is 20 f assignment per meter. And ionosphere potential 250 kilovolt. Total resistance of the atmosphere RT 230 ohm. And columnar resistance, it is 120 because ohm per uh, ohm meter square. Now, what is the objective of of our work? So, this work has been done uh, with these objectives. Number one, continuous measurements of unipolar atmospheric electrical conductivity during solar disturbed monsoon period. Second objective, measurements of meteorological parameters during monsoon period. And third parameter is study of correlation or any type of linkage between atmospheric conductivity and various meteorological parameters. So measurements of the atmospheric conductivity was done uh, with the help of guardian tube. 
this guardian tube consists of uh, consists of outer cylinder so in which inner cylinder is also placed so a potential difference is, is also applied and current is measured with the help of electrometer amplifier since current is very small it is of the order of picoampere so it is used with the help of electrometer amplifier so uh, this slide shows the working of the uh, sorry description of the instrument the instrument consists of the sensor for ionic concentration electrometer amplifier and chart recorder so out of the two cylinders outer cylinder was just used to uh, capture all the incoming particles so that they may pass through the inner cylinder the diameter of the inner cylinder was 9.5 cm while outer cylinder was made up of 10.5 cm of size the intake of air was added by with the help of air blower so this is this slide shows the working of the instrument so it, so i am not going into the detail of the working of the in instrument now these are our results so we have uh, we have uh, taken measurements for the monsoon period of 2018 so we have taken the uh, taken the measurements for the uh, for the three months june july and august so this figure this figure shows the uh, variation of electrical conductivity with days so we have taken five minutes data and then takes average for the 15 minutes and then uh, we have uh, we did it for for whole day so this slide shows the variation of uh, surface electrical conductivity with days and uh, the second figure, figure in the panel shows the variation of wind speed with the days third figure for the average temperature with days fourth figure for the for the uh, relative humidity with days and fifth figure for the rainfall because rainfall is also important because it uh, induces some uh, charged particles in the in the atmosphere now this figure is for for the month of june so same uh, same variation as shown for the la last month this figure shows now this figure shows the variation of electrical conductivity wind speed temperature rain, uh, relative humidity and and rainfall for the uh, for the month of july also we have taken observations for the august of 2018 so same variations of different parameters have been shown with the days now the third objective was to study the correlation of the of the different parameters so uh, this figure shows how the uh, how the electrical conductivity is correlated with wind speed as well as with average temperature relative humidity and rainfall so i saw one by one so this figure shows the electrical conductivity versus wind speed relationship the correlation coefficient was found to be 0 0.31 so you see there, there was a positive slope a trend line a trend line of linear nature is also shown here it is y equal to 4.89 x plus 21.63 this slide shows the variation of electrical conductivity with average temperature so this is the important figure in which the correlation coefficient was found to be negative there, there was a negative correlation between the electric conductivity and the average temperature so trend line was y equal to minus 1.8 x plus 88.55 now this uh, this slide shows the variation of electric conductivity which is of the order of 10 to minus 10 to power minus 16 simon per meter so variation of electric conductivity with the relative humidity rh is taken in terms of percentage so here a positive correlation was found and the correlation coefficient obtained statistically it was found to be 0 0.19 and the trend line was y equal to 0 0.25 x plus 14.37 now this slide shows the variation of electrical conductivity with the rainfall so again there is a positive slope was found and correlation coefficient was positive but it was found to be small so r was found to be 0 0.13 r square is also calculated and the trend line was y equal to 0 0.13 x plus 32.52 here y refers to the electrical conductivity and x refers to the relative parameter so in this case it is rainfall which is in millimeter now conclusions 
so first was atmospheric electrical conductivity was positively correlated with wind speed relativity and rainfall while it was found to be negatively correlated with average temperature in the monsoon period second the salt range analysis of the present atmospheric data shows shows the wind shows that the wind is an important factor that modifies the behavior of electrical conductivity third whereas the measurements were taken at a semi urban location of india but the findings were expect, expected to be valid for all the subtropical regions also fourth the important findings of the present paper hint at the salt range variations in surface atmospheric electrical parameters by incorporating the meteorological parameters and the last is the meteorological parameters such as relative humidity temperature rainfall and and wind speed play an important roles to investigate the aerosol behavior but large amount of precipitation can change the number density and size distribution of aerosols is more effective than rh and wind speed so these are the references uh, for, for this work and all the references are uh, are concerned with atmospheric electrical parameters yes so thank you sir thank you for inviting me yes Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar. It's a very interesting talk. Yeah. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, if not, I have a quick question. Like uh, looking at your correlation between rainfall and connectivity, uh, all yeah. this coming like 0.13, but looking the data like scatter plot, it it seems like it's kind of very uh, Kind of not a real correlation because because of that one point you have further in the right that's bring the correlation because most of the data in the zero lines so you can go ahead and do some significant test it doesn't seem is uh kind of significant it's mostly zero uh anyway that, that's that's the comment you, you you may reply on that comment yes sir sir in this uh, in this talk i have shown only the uh, the variation of electrical conductivity conductivity with meteorological parameters but there are some other parameters which are to be considered like as uh, aerosols concentration of aerosols and their sizes are very important because uh, they modify they modify the variation of electrical conductivity because because aerosols uh, modifies the microphysics which is concerned with the clouds so that's why other parameters should also be considered besides it. Yes. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank thanks. you, Dr. Kumar. Uh, yeah. So now I'm cordially invited the next uh, speaker, Dr. Elena Surovatkina. Uh, pardon me if I uh, mispronounce your last name. So yeah, I think you can stop sharing, Dr. Kumar. Dr. Elena, start sharing the screen. Just wait, sir. I am trying to stop it. Sir, you can answer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We unshared from our side. You can see the slide. Let's make it full screen. Just a second. Is it hot? Yes, please go ahead. And uh, you have 10 oh. minutes. Okay. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let us discuss uh, prediction onset and withdrawal of Indian summer monsoon, recent advance, and regional extension. Facing climate change, we desperately need prediction. As we saw in previous presentation, uh, significant progress has been uh, achieved in numerical weather prediction, uh, heat waves, uh, uh, extreme uh, rainfall. However, 
forecasting a monsoon onset and withdrawal and specific location of Indian subcontinent remains a great challenge. The weather, uh, the limitation of current model prevents further progress and new strategies desperately needed in weather and climate sciences, uh, according to Stephen and Bonnie. So here I show you a new understanding of essential mechanism of monsoon arriving, arrival and withdrawal allows me to predict monsoon timing more than a month in advance. The approach is fundamentally different from numerical weather forecast. It based on a following ground rule, statistical physics principles, new special temporal regularities and monsoon system of teleconnection between tipping elements and data analysis. You can see details in uh, our general paper. Such a strategy opens um, the possibility for long-term uh, prediction in meteorology and uh, climate science. It's applied where numerical models fall, particularly in uh, monsoon timing prediction. The main uh, statement has come to me from the defini definition of an Krishnan and Saman. I upgrade this definition with this single word, a critical transition. So a transition to monsoon is a critical transition from regime of sporadic rainfall to specially organized and temporarily sustainable rainfall. The appearance of criticality in definition led us to statistical physics approach, a critical phenomena. In particular, on the eve of critical transition, variance of fluctuations in observable is increasing in saturated. As you can see uh, on the map, there is a variance of uh, uh, near surface temperature of 1000 hectopascal from Sepinkari analysis. So you can see the variance of fluctuation three weeks before, one week before, and one day before onset of monsoon over Eastern Ghat. We can see strong uh, increase in fluctuation in two areas, Eastern Ghat and North Pakistan. And this uh, uh, increase in fluctuation shows upcoming instability in this region. In Eastern Ghat, critical transition to monsoon. But in uh, North Pakistan, uh, Western dis disturbance. Let, let us look inside into these uh, two regions. So, by example, 2021, uh, the red line show temperature in Mr. God, blue line show temperature in North Pakistan. As you can see, uh, and purple and gray show five years average. And you can see the two temperature intersect twice. First time, this is the intersection at the critical temperature of monsoon in Eastern Ghats region. And second intersection happens in uh, a temperature, monsoon, monsoon temperature. So if you compare um, this period of time with daily precipitation, you can see that this period of time is exactly correspond to uh, monsoon season from onset, this is the first intersection, and withdrawal, this is the uh, second intersection. So this finding allowed me to predict monsoon onset and withdrawal 40 days in advance. So I have tested methodology for Eastern Ghats region for six years, and I'll show you the result at the end of my presentation. And here, uh, let us go from Eastern Ghats to Delhi region, which I tested for a first time to 20, in 2021. Uh, uh, there is a forecasting scheme, and I made my forecast on May 8th, and the temperature in Delhi showed by red, and temperature in North Pakistan showed by blue. And you can see if you, we consider temperature in Delhi only, this is fundamentally impossible to predict where temperature in Delhi start to drop down and reach critical temperature. However, we have another uh, location, North Pakistan. North, uh, temperature in North Pakistan, uh, this period of time, increasing linearly, it's giving me opportunity to calculate how many uh, days it takes 
temperature in North Pakistan reach critical temperature in Delhi. So, as you can see, uh, my prediction on May of 2021 was between 11 and 90 of July. The result of uh, monsoon come on 13th of July. And this is unprecedentedly late onset of monsoon in Delhi. And uh, I predicted actually 60 days in advance. It was correct. And uh, all my forecast published in Indian newspaper, Man Mansoon uh, page, um, and uh, uh, available publicly. So on 16 of August 2021, I forecast withdrawal uh, from Delhi. So uh, uh, Mansoon come actually one week later than I estimated. And but this is it was my first test, and I will consider this. Um, delay in uh, my current uh, 2022 year. So, uh, climate change affects Indian summer monsoon timing in the following aspects. If the temperature on the PDPV of monsoon in Pakistan and Afghanistan is high, it leads to delay the withdrawal of monsoon. Because it takes longer when uh, whole uh, continent, uh, continent cool down to the temperature of monsoon withdrawal. If temperature in North Pakistan low, for example, in 20, 2021, about four degrees less compared to compared to average for last year, it shrinks the duration of monsoon season. It takes less time when temperature in North Pakistan reaches the temperature level in eastern Ghats. And one more observation: when Indian subcontinent gets colder uh, faster, it attracts northeast wind early. This is what we observe in 2020-2021. So um, uh, I would like to show you uh, one more uh, interesting observation of climate change. Um, if we split uh, long-term observation, monsoon transition into two group, abrupt transition shown by blue, this is a fast transition with strong rain and a uh, two step or multiple step transition uh, uh, with dry spell within the step. So, indicated by brown and yellow. You can see from 2007 to 2021, transition to monsoon was only two times uh, fast and good, uh, what farmer uh, consider as a good monsoon. But this is a clear uh, climate change effect uh, that uh, very important to consider for a strat developing strategy for climate ad adaptation for farmer and Indian uh, authorities. So, and this is result of my observation for six years from 2016 to 2021. Uh, you can see that um, observation uh, is a very good uh, confirm uh, my forecast as onset and withdrawal for Eastern Ghats region. So, uh, conclusion, the new methodology offers the following advantage, predicting the date of upcoming monsoon 40 days in advance. This is unprecedentedly early. Forecasting withdrawal date for 70 days in advance. And this is only one available withdrawal forecast in India. Applicability of methodology is not limited by specific location. It works for different parts of India and around the globe. The six years test shows successful results. And very clearly, example in Tanzania, I'm doing forecast in uh, South Tanzania, uh, and then I'm doing, and then uh, currently I'm doing forecast in Telangana, Eastern Ghat, Delhi, and um, in Sea of Akhotsk in uh, North Pacific. This, this is a forecast of ice season using a similar methodology. And possible expansion is South Asia, more uh, region in Africa, uh, South America, and North America. Thank you very much for your attention, and this is my references. Thank you very much, Dr. Elena. It's excellent talk, and I was really amazed to see that you skill in 70 days uh, in lead time. So, yeah, let's see. Is there any question? Let's see, ask chat. Let's see, it is. Uh, 
no. Maybe I take this privilege and ask. I have two question actually. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, I was I was studying some of your papers uh, because uh, I had a working experience with uh, Dr. Pai and Dr. Sujit for that MOK prediction, what they are doing with the principal component regression and regarding that discussion I was starting. So did you have any results on the Kerala? Because all of your results is actually the area where is the monsoon came very late and very dry, let's say Delhi or in central India. So do you publish any paper on monsoon over Kerala? Over Kerala? So uh, I did uh, make, I, I able to do this. But it doesn't make sense because Dr. Pai doing this very well. So uh, the idea is to contribute uh, more to Indian society. Uh, I mean, in different places. So uh, my condition uh, from this approach actually valid for every point of Indian, not Indian subcontinent, actually around the tropics and monsoon area also because it's uh, work for ice season also. And uh, I'm doing very well in Kerala, so I do not like to repeat it. It does make Yeah, but they're, they're focused in two weeks, actually in 14 days lead. Yes. That's uh, what yes. I was thinking about your 60 days or 70 days lead forecast over there. Yes, uh, so they uh, published their forecast on 15th of May, but I uh, made my forecast early on 8th of May. And then my forecast for recent gas is if they are for us in Kerala, so we contribute uh, uh, to each other, let me say. So, uh, and uh, it, I, I hope it helps uh, Indian population. Sure, great. And the last quick question, like, what is your prediction error? Like, you give a range, right? Like, you're not giving one plus, day. So what's yes. your prediction error? Plus minus four, four days for onset and plus right. minus five days for withdrawal because onset is abrupt transition. It's, uh, but uh, in data fluctuation is actually uh, four days uh, error. Uh, but uh, uh, withdrawal, this is a uh, continuous transition. This is why it takes a little bit longer because it could be uh, intersection several times. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And at this time for our final presentation, Dr. Mohan Tota. Uh, uh, Dr. Adrian, if you stop sharing your screen. Yes, I'm going to stop. Uh, uh, stop sharing, so I can Yeah, Dr. Tota, please share your screen. Uh, I had a, some technical glitch with my PC. It's, uh, it's not able to share. So, can admin can share my presentation? Sure. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, you, fine. it is yours. Ten minutes. Yeah. Right. Fine. So, as the title suggests, uh, I would like to talk about the process-based diagnostics in uh, the newly generated IMDA reanalysis uh, at, at, at NCMRWF, which is a high-resolution um, reanalysis in, for the Indian monsoon region. So, these are my collaborators. So, basically, it's uh, it's all started with the NOVA Modeling Analysis Prediction and Projects Program MAP Model Diagnostics and Task Force to promote the uh, process oriented diagnostics for several several processes uh, or tropical and extra tropical regions uh, if you look at the graphical picture on the right side right hand side you can see several physical processes uh, which are neatly described here so starting from the mjo space uh, mjo amplitude um, phase spectra starting uh, extra tropical variances connect to transition stats enzo monsoon jet stream everything on the card. So the idea of the process oriented diagnostics is to improve the parameterations and second one is to address the long standing model biases. Yeah, previously <clears throat> the one example is that we have a dry and wet biases for Indian monsoon um, or Indian longitude during boreal summer monsoon. A uh, few minutes before Richard Keen has showed some uh, um, biases for Indian region. So 
these are long standing problems so to address these problems and to better understand the physics the um, uh, mdtf has uh, um, promoted the development of pods uh, and then uh, to ensure that we get whatever we got from the diagnostics give you the right answers for the right reasons and to bridge the gaps in understanding of the physical process the advantage of this pods are two folded one is uh, the verification results will be very useful for the developers um, with the nwp weather and climate models the, and the second one is that the, it will give you additional insight for the forecast users. So with this background, the scientific issue that I'm going to address today is the, I just, um, I will give you, I will assess the IMDAS performance um, in representing some of the key physical process as well with the boreal summer months. So, so I'm not going into the IMDAS system, uh, but one thing is that it is UM based, which is already having some kind of uh, <clears throat> biases uh, when we talk about the boreal summer monsoon. The, advanced, the point to be noted here is that it is a very speci high, highly spe high special resolution reanalysis, regional reanalysis, um, which is uh, um, similar with a lot of uh, in situ observations starting from surface, upper air aircraft, and satellite derived, so which is an added advantage for this reanalysis product. So, interested you, uh, readers can look those articles for more details. Oh, uh, next. Yeah. So, um, like any, um, it's a it's a prerequisite for any um, climate model or weather or reanalysis product to represent uh, its, its ability to simulate uh, climate, uh, climatological mean or the mean state um, uh, correctly. So, if you look at the IMDA um, rainfall climatology from June to September, uh, that is from 1979 to 2018, nearly about uh, 40 years. So, the climatological rainfall maxima. Or the principal rainfall maxima of the central India, uh, Western Ghats, or the Head Bay of Bengal, foothills of Himalayas, in the equatorial Indian Ocean, everything is uh, seen perfectly. Uh, principal rainfall rainfall maxima is, in other words, the heat sources. So, but if you look at the bias, like my earlier speaker has mentioned, there is a strong red bias for the equatorial Indian Ocean, and dryness uh, can be seen over the central India. Uh, again, there is orographic regions of Himalaya and Himalayan foothills of Himalaya. There is a positive bias. So the excess marsh, excess rainfall over the Ector Indian Ocean, uh, which is seen in the two uh, two um, bias pictures, which is uh, calculated from the two different data sets. One is from the GPCP and other from the TRMM. The coherent the spatial structures, um, the excess excess rainfall over the Ector Indian Ocean is indicating that it. It may affect the um, kelvin ross B wave activity over that uh, over equatorial regions um, to the dynamics. And this local may induce some kind of a local hadley cell descent over central India because equatorial to the descent region or central India and can uh, induce a dryness in the column that can happen. So we need to look why these bias are popping up. And But if you look at the annual cycle um, or the three regions, um, the regions are central India, the boxes you can see on the left corner, or the three regions, which are actually chosen in such a way that these three regions have uh, shows a large synaptic uh, subseasonal variability uh, during the monsoon season. So if you look at the annual cycle, most of the annual cycle or the three regions is very good as associated. But if you look at the close examination uh, or the or the Western Equatorial Indian Ocean, majority of the days, uh, in June and July uh, shows excess precipitation um, and in dryness or Bay of Bengal uh, slightly in June and um, second uh, second week of August or some kind of uh, uh, in, in, in the mid-August uh, uh, those time those timings. Uh, other than that, uh, what I can say is that despite having these differences in the magnitude, uh, the phase is good and it is an encouraging aspect to go further. Next. So before going into look the vertical structure, what we have done, we have made a small comparison study. Uh, um, this is uh, this is with the radio sound observations, which is available over central India. Uh, we took one station, that is Nagpur. Um, I given the lat longs here. So uh, the long term data set is obtained from the IGRA um, integrated radio sound essence. Um, uh, it's a freely available. <coughs> so those long term data set, though there are some gaps, we had a very good long term data set, and then. We made some kind of a quality control and we made some comparison study with the nearest in the grid. So if you look at the uh, two dimensional histograms of the basic parameters, um, the winds, the bottom panel, 
The middle panel is the C CPT, CPT, that means the cold point tropopause or the cold point temperature that shows the uh, strength of the cold point uh, tropopause, uh, strength of the tropopause, and the, and, the, and the other one is the surface temperature or the surface partial temperature, you can say. All are very good in association, except in, if you look at the vertical profiles of RH, C fats, this is C the contour frequency by altitude diagram, shows a large excess of moisture in the boundary layer and some around this. 200 hectopascal or over the 200 hectopascal regions, which may affect the bond layer process and also the radiative, radiative process around that height. Uh, that is one uh, one glitch. Next one. So with that, we want to see how this uh, how the vertical biases are uh, looked in IMDA. So we took the best reanalysis available. So that is ERA-5, and then we compared the vertical, we calculated the vertical biases. The temperature bias shows that the, most of the um, most of the region below 600 hectopascal is warm, although the magnitudes are less than 1 Kelvin, they are significant. And above, above 600 hectopascal, most of the region is uh, experiencing a cold temperature. So this, this uh, warm below and cold above is kind of an unstable region, although three region. But the main difference is when you look at the moisture, the surface moisture or the central India, there is a land region, there is a large uh, positive bias. And the thing to be noticed is that the free tropospheric moisture is very high in the equatorial Indian Ocean. Uh, we speculate that this may be one reason where um, this could be one reason to get a wet bias for the equatorial Indian Ocean, but we're not sure. We need to look further. But the main difference is if you look at the uh, vertical velocity uh, bias, equatorial Indian Ocean, the, 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 both the reanalysis doesn't have any, uh, I can say they're, they're matching well. But the biases are more prominent over central India, where the large scale descent. Uh, this is what I'm talking about, the uh, local headless cell descent over the central India, and then can uh, induce some kind of dryness in the column. And this can, uh, this can induce some kind of a uh, break condition over India. And then in the Bay of Bengal, uh, the vertical velocity bias is positive. Uh, so top, uh, so that is this. This this is this is maybe one region where the excess mo excess moisture, uh, the ex uh, updraft convection can be more prominent in the Bay of Bengal region. Next, please. So with that uh, background, what we have done is that we applied the process oriented diagnostics. Uh, this is one diagnostics. This is a convective transition statistics, which will give you an idea of uh, how the moisture convection feedback mechanism at different time scales. Here we took uh, the da daily data. So remember that this all these uh, stats are has done through the uh, during the boreal summer monsoon. So we compare these stats with uh, the competitive stats with the TMI observation. So what we have done is that we buy, we bin the data, the column water vapor data associated with the precipitation. So the binning of the so the bin, column water vapor bins on the x-axis and the y-axis shows the rainfall millimeter per day. So the curve indicates the pickup of the precipitation. If you look at the observation. After 55 millimeters, in the total column moisture, if it exceeds 55 millimeters, the observation shows a strong uh, pickup. But whereas the pickup is uh, very gradual or maybe slow, you can say, relatively slow in IMDA. But in the ocean, this is the Bay of Bengal. This blue, blue curves indicates all the Bay of Bengal. Observations and reanalysis shows uh, more or less similar pickup in the precipitation. So then the land precipitation has some issue with the IMDA compared to the uh, TMI observation. Um, the right hand, right, the cor right corner um, uh, picture is the distribution of distribution of rainfall, uh, the probability of rainfall at different rainfall thresholds. This is less than five, and then between five to twenty, and then greater than twenty. Or I can say uh, different uh, in a vaguely. I can say from shallow to deep convection, or the different convective regime or the precipitation regimes. So you can say that low rainfall regimes, uh, both the observations and uh, IMDA are uh, observations on TMI are showing a very good uh, distribution. But as soon as we go for the higher ends, uh, the distributions are skewed. That this could be uh, maybe because of the shortcoming in the microphysical or the cloud parameters. Uh, microphysical parameters has uh, some issue with the IMDA, which has to be looked further. Next, please. So the immediate question then comes into the mind is, uh, what happens to the, when the column is, uh, be a column column or water is different so oh, okay so the free tropospheric moisture is also uh, different in the imda and era 5 which is uh, uh, 
in the in, in, in era 5 it is uh, uh, highly sensitive to the deep convection but whereas imda it is the boundary layer moisture that is uh, indicating the uh, di dictating the precipitation next please so what we have done is we have looked at this subseasonal variability in the um, the rainfall so this is the rainfall events for the central india um, I mean, three days and more uh, four days and something like that. We have segregated the rainfall and then uh, we looked at the subseasonal variability and then they are matching well. IMDA and the observations, the different legend indicates the different data sets. And then in all the data sets, the, the performance of IMDA as uh, the phase of the IMDA is uh, good. Next, please. I am not going into the detail. Next one. So this one is the another um, POD, Process and Diagnostics. We took at the extended break event at 1, 2019, that happened in July. And then we applied the moisture budget. Uh, this is, uh, I have not given the complete moisture budget here. I'm just giving the leading moisture terms uh, to just give you an indication that the POD's in different uh, data sets, IMD, um, IMDA, and then ERA-5 are, are perfectly matching with the existing results. So it's uh, convergence is uh, uh, aligning better with the presentation, but whereas the dryness leading the rainfall by nearly seven to eight days in era, however, the leading nature in the dryness is uh, more than 10 days uh, in IMDA. And then there are large residuals uh, close to the close to the magnitudes of uh, tendencies. That is uh, one thing to look. Uh, but to, uh, to uh, uh, identify from where this dryness is coming, we, I have check in two boxes one is Arabian Sea and Central India and then the theta E uh, anomalies are plotted so you can see that in the anomalies or the Arabian Sea that the blue box they are occurring much 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 earlier than the um, uh, than the Central India where zero indicates the peak dry phase so which is propagating from the Arabian Sea uh, to the uh, Central India that's what I can conclude but then this can also be verified with the dissecting the horizontal moisture advection component into perturbation and climate um, mean and perturbation component, then I can see, I can check the um, circulation anomalies, how the moisture is, uh, sources are coming from different areas. Next, please. Dr. Thot, I'm sorry. Yeah. You have, you uh, have to wrap up. This, this is another, this, this. I, can, I can stop here. I can take the questions. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thota. It's great work. Uh, any questions from the audience or the YouTube? If not, I thank you again, Dr. Thota, and thanks all the speaker and uh, all the talks are very interesting, very thought provoking, provoking. And uh, thanks for uh, although we start late, but we are kind of within time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nashkar. Nice to see you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nachiketa. Uh, so uh, it's a nice uh, uh, conducted session and uh, the speakers are actually nicely maintained their time and uh, hopefully a uh, lot of questions may be there in the mind or maybe it will be coming up uh, later stage so uh, the because this uh, session will be on youtube for long uh, so therefore uh, all speakers should attend uh, for uh, forthcoming questions if it is there. So that is the request from the organizer. And so uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, session coordinator, uh, Dr. Nachiketa, and all the speakers. So today we'll be uh, concluding the day here, but tomorrow again we'll be uh, in the first uh, phase of the uh, last day uh, in the morning time. Uh, in India, suddenly in the morning time in India. So, okay. Uh, good night uh, and have also a good day.